I have lived in Boise, Idaho my whole life, and the only other state I've ever visited is Oregon. It is closest to my home besides Washington. My parents were never the type of people that liked to travel a lot and explore, while I was always a bit different. Ever since I was little, I've enjoyed playing outside, going off into nature and catching animals if I could, generally exploring. Since I'm still not old enough to drive, I had not had the chance to visit more places than I wanted to, and I'm very eager to do so once I can do it. Luckily, I have a friend who is two years older than I, and he got his driver's license about a year ago. So, we began going on some smaller road trips together. We still did not travel very far. He is a beginner driver, and he's very intimidated by traffic situations. At least we could visit some national forests and parks. Idaho is one of the bigger states. It isn't very populated. A lot of the state is covered with just rough terrain and lots of wildlife. One day, my friend and I decided to go on a short one-night trip to the city of Arling, which is about 100 miles out of Boise. The plan was to start in the afternoon and reach Arling somewhere in the evening. We would have time to go down to the shore of Lake Cascade and set up a tent there for the night. It was not a long trip, so we didn't do much planning. We loaded some basic gear in my friend's car, headed for our spot. It took us about two hours to reach there, and a little more time on foot to go all the way down to the lake. The evening was very peaceful, warm, perfect for a night out. We pitched up our tent, put our gear inside along with our sleeping bags, then constructed a small fire. We grilled some meat that we had brought for dinner. The sun was almost set, and the scenery was just perfect, like something you'd see out of a fold-out magazine for hunting. After the sun had completely set and a full moon had taken its place, it made the night even look more spectacular. Stars twinkling in the sky, the moonlight reflecting perfectly on the lake, giving it this haunting yellowish-silver color. We thought we couldn't have picked a better night to stay. We just talked and enjoyed the scenery for hours and spent hours just chit-chatting before we all got tired enough to call it a night. After crawling inside our tent and toward the warmth of our sleeping bags, my friend is a pretty deep sleeper, and in no longer than two minutes, he was snoring. I could tell the trip really took out of him. It made it a lot more difficult for me to sleep, however, due to his snoring and, well, I'm a light sleeper. I tossed and turned for at least 20 minutes, I just could not fall asleep. Maybe I was overstimulated. I realized then, my friend wasn't snoring anymore, and something else would not let me sleep. I had a feeling that someone or something was watching us from outside the tent. Maybe it was just my paranoia. I decided to get up and check, just for my own head. I slowly unzipped the tent halfway, and peeked my head outside. I scanned around with my flashlight, thinking this is ridiculous. There's going to be nothing here. After all, I'd found nothing anyway. I went back inside and tried to shrug off the feeling, but it just wouldn't go away. It was very persistent. Something was near the tent. I could feel it. I was never a kid that believed in ghosts and goblins, but there's just something not right. Once again, after another 20 minutes, I humored my instinct by peeking my head out yet again shining my flashlight all around, expecting to see something. Nothing again. This time, I decided to play inspector. Moved my flashlight around a little deeper, looking, and I finally spotted something in the distance just by the water. For a few seconds, I was staring at something, trying to figure out what it was. But it was stupid of me to keep the light pointed at it. Whatever it was by the lake slowly turned, revealing its face and its eyes. It didn't look too scary or ghastly. It just looked like some weird animal I'd never seen before. Even though it didn't look menacing or like it was going to attack, I turned off the light and walked very quickly back into my tent, nudged my friend a few times until he woke up. 
He didn't believe me at first and thought I was screwing around with him. He decided to check for himself. We both poked our heads outside, only to see that thing was now a lot closer. But now it was in the water, so we could only see it from the waist up. The moonlight was strong enough to help us see this animal. It had small ears and very huge teeth. It reminded me of some sort of oversized humanoid sloth thing. While we're looking at it, the animal began to move around, like it was looking for something. Not long after, it caught a small animal we could not see and devoured it whole in a matter of seconds. They made this long, drawn-out, really low-sounding groan. We felt very frightened and just tried to stay calm and hope it did not come near us. I'd never seen an animal like this in my life, either had my friend. I remembered some of the scary stories about real monsters that we used to tell each other as children. One of those stories was about a creature called the Yukon Beaver Eater. It was the resemblance of that thing we were seeing at the lake, and the description of the story was uncanny. I was almost sure that it was real and that we were looking at one right now. It's bigger than a grizzly bear, if you can imagine, and equipped with teeth that could break your bones in a matter of seconds. Luckily, this creature was never hostile and seemed to kind of mind its own business, like it was there to coexist with us and leave us alone. But its presence was frightening, to say the least, even though it never showed any signs of aggression. It dunked its entire body back under the water again. We could hear it, eating something else very large. It made that long, drawn-out low groan again. My friend and I were just shuddering in the tent, expecting to come over to us. Then, we could hear it slowly, kind of take itself out of the water. It was lumbering and very slow, very heavy, and we could hear the trees parting as it went into the forest. And finally, the sounds of it leaving became more and more distant, and that's when we knew it was gone. After it had left, the feeling of something around our tent left, and, well, I'd like to say I was peacefully able to sleep through the night, but this was not the case. My friend and I laid awake in our tent, almost for a few more hours, but felt like all night, expecting this thing to come back and devour us whole, but it never did. The night remained quiet, and we lied awake talking about what it could have been, and just how frightening it was, the sheer size of it alone, trying to think of what animal it could have been. Maybe it was a bear. Our sloths out this way? It didn't look like a bear. We debated for a while, before finally and eventually falling asleep, which felt like pretty early in the morning. Even now, I'm not so sure we've made the right guess. I still consider this a very interesting experience. I'm just glad we didn't make any noise or do anything to upset it. After all, we didn't want to draw any attention to ourselves more than we had to. I'm pretty sure if it devoured what it did whole, we would have become dinner in no time had we made it angry. I'm a paranormal investigator. Well, an aficionado, for the moment. I live in Idaho, a pretty boring state overall. Whether you're looking for the paranormal or not, we have a few ghost stories here and there and even our own lake monster. I mean, in this day and age, what state doesn't? We also have a place that supposedly inspired the Bates Motel from the movie Psycho. Yet, I hadn't ever been able to make contact, but that was over. I knew I wasn't looking hard enough. If I ever wanted to get a creature on camera, it was time to get a little more hands-on. And I did. This is the story of my first real encounter with a supernatural entity. I just heard about this legend from a friend of my grandmother, about the water babies of Massacre Rocks. Supposedly, when a famine had struck, a group of Native Americans living in the region were forced to drown their own infants in the river to avoid making them suffer a life of starvation. It is said that if you stay in the riverbank till midnight, you'll hear their cries and see them rise above water, having developed gills and hostility for humankind. And knowing the park wasn't far away, I knew this was a chance I had to take. I organized a camping trip with my best friend and fellow paranormal enthusiast, 
Ethan. I asked my father if he could drive us to Massacre Rock State Park, letting us spend the night there. He dropped us in the park early afternoon, so we had hours to plan our approach. I told Ethan right off the bat we should leave our stuff in a designated camping area. But once it was dark, we should move right next to the riverbank and get a better chance of finding creatures once we'd see them return to base camp. He wasn't sure about this. I assured him we would be fine, that we could take turns to stay and watch and see if anybody was coming. He just suggested placing a GoPro, heading close to the riverbank and watching remotely from the campground. But come on, I knew that wasn't going to work. You know how those things turn out. They'd only ever come if they felt human presence. In a sense, we were the bait. We had spent most of the day asking people about the babies and their experience, even though most of them had never even heard the legends. Even the rangers had assured us that they had heard faint wailings coming from the river late at night. It sounded promising, and once the sun began to set, we made a fireplace in one of the designated spots, roasting some sausages and marshmallows. I'd also brought a few energy drinks and a granola bar, Rock stars and monsters were my favorite. This, of course, would be later for the night, when we needed to be our most awake and alert. Ethan was now beginning to act nervous. He and I had never spent an entire night on a paranormal location, so I assured him we would be fine. We had to be brave after all. It was the only way to ever find something. After checking the clock and seeing it was about 10.30 p.m., it was time to go. We made sure that nobody was around, scrambling out. Now, the river was still a good 15-minute walk away from camp, so we had to get moving, and now. Trying to be sneaky, avoiding the rangers, made us even slower. So we ended up making it to the river by roughly around 11 p.m. Now, we set up our sleeping bags, set our snacks right in between us, and sat to wait. Cameras at the ready. Ethan acted very nervous, in turn, making me nervous. We didn't really have a plan if we were attacked by anything, whether that be an entity, a demon, or one of these babies. I told them we would be fine. After all, we weren't really sure how violent they could be. In hindsight, I totally underestimated them. Now, it was about 11.30. Both Ethan and I were beginning to get pretty tired, so we're sitting there, sipping on a monster. 11.45. It would soon be time. I was nervous. I felt my stomach churning and tingling. Five minutes later. 11.50. Now, my hands were shaking. Ethan just stared at the river, tense and ready to make a run for it. Then came midnight. I stared deeply into the river. We both immediately shut up. Five minutes went by, of pure silence. The night was quiet. That got to ten minutes. Nothing had happened yet. I was getting disappointed, when I suddenly heard a very faint cry. Although it wasn't a baby, it sounded more like an animal being hurt. A second later, a similar cry had joined in. And in that moment, it sounded like a thousand wails at the same time, coming straight from the river. Ethan began shaking and I saw him trying to get up. I held him down. We'd made it all the way here already. And in that moment, we began to notice movement in the water. I hit Ethan on the shoulder, telling him to look. We could see something big moving underneath the water of the river. Whatever it was, there was multiples of them. And then, things got a little more intense. All around us, we began hearing this demonic, almost primal chanting, like something you hear at some sort of ritual being sacrificed. And it got louder and louder, as if we were surrounded, and was coming closer. The water was almost looking like it was boiling, bubbling, and lots of movement, but nothing ever breaking in the surface. To say Ethan and I were terrified in that moment would be a drastic understatement. The feeling of impending doom was incredibly overwhelming. Ethan shoved me to the side and said, screw this, 
I'm not going to be anybody's sacrificial lamb, jumping up and running back the way we came. I can't say I'm brave. I was cowardice as well, running after him, too afraid to find out what exactly was going to come out of the river. I didn't want to know. After running after Ethan and trying to get him to calm down, he wouldn't. He would not stop until we were back at camp. In what seemed like maybe 30 minutes of running, and almost literally collapsing right near our tents from exhaustion of running, I was then cussed out by Ethan, who basically said something along the lines of, How dare you bring me out here? How dare you put me in harm's way like that? We have no idea what we're messing with and then something about the forces of evil and blah, blah, blah. I tried to have an irrational conversation with him to try and calm him down and explain that we have to go back. But he kept cutting me off and telling me, if I want to go and die, I can be my own guest. But to offer ourselves up on a silver platter as a sacrifice or food to whatever those things were, it was out of the question. Non-negotiable. My hands were practically shaking, and Ethan was trembling, white as a sheet. I had never seen him so scared in my life. I guess I can't blame him after all. It felt as if we had almost had our own standoff with death itself. It was not exciting, and I regret it. I definitely underestimated the power of the supernatural. And I take no shame in saying that we barely slept that night, trying to get him to make plans for that we can come back and see those things on camera if that was going to even be possible. Ethan, the later it got, wouldn't even acknowledge my request, telling me I'm on my own. And while I still do like to consider myself a paranormal investigator, I know my resources and my abilities are very limited, especially after having my own first run-in with the supernatural. And I almost wonder, had I stayed that night, would I have ever actually seen something, or could I have really gotten hurt? I guess the only way for me to know for sure is to go back there, but I'm just too frightened to. This is something that happened when I was just 19. I don't like talking about it necessarily, but I feel it would be good to get this out of my system, especially because the other person involved in this incident was my girlfriend at the time and is someone whom I've gone on separate ways in in life. We're no longer together, but that's in hindsight now. She was the only person, though, with whom I could discuss this. Others would think I'm lying or even delusional, and nobody likes getting mocked or made to feel like they're insane. So let me go ahead and explain my story. My girlfriend and I were backpacking together, feeling adventurous and also wanting to do dumb things. We grew up pretty broke, never had much money, and we pretty much stayed around where we grew up, southern Idaho. We'd camp and fish and journey around and just decided to visit Pocatello. The town had a very interesting story, and we felt it was best to explore it and hike around and camp around. We journeyed around and even visited and camped at the Snake River, being broke, you're kind of limited to what you can and can't do. And since getting a hotel was completely out of our budget, we'd have to settle for tent camping out by the lake. So there we were, by the fire, right near our tent, and we had managed to buy some marshmallows, which we were roasting, talking about stuff and our life together, thinking what we were going to do for our future. And at some point, we were just there, enjoying the quiet and the silence and the sounds of nature, which were very quiet. We were camping in a field by the shore of the Snake River. It was a larger meadow. There were few trees, but at night, it was just dark. The stars above us looked amazing, but not something we could see in our own hometown. We were relaxed, just enjoying our thoughts. Then it happened. I felt this tenseness in the air. My girlfriend did the same. I can see the look on her face now, thinking back to it. Even the air around us changed. Everything felt different. We felt out of place, like we didn't belong. And we realized there were no sounds anymore. The crickets that had kept us accompanied by our conversation were now silent. There were no wind, no leaves moving, 
It was unnaturally quiet. And it seems like, out of nowhere, we started hearing this woman sobbing. Like, heavily sobbing. And so we start looking at each other and looking around us, uh, trying to dictate where this noise is coming from. And it sounded like it was coming down the hill towards the shore of the river. I don't know, but I had a very bad feeling about it. We took our flashlights and wanted to go inspect. Maybe somebody was really hurt. Maybe it was a human trafficking trap. So we decided against our better judgment to go and help this poor soul. We turned on our flashlights and walked down there, calmly and quietly calling out who was there, but no answer. The sobbing just continued. Keep in mind, this was also many, many years before cell phones, so all we had was our flashlights. Maybe somebody was trying to prank us. We weren't sure. The Snake River has a part where its course is anastomosed, so you'd see small sedimentary islands. I'm a geology nerd. Can't help it. Accumulated thanks to the water flow. In other words, it was hard as heck to see what was there. But the sobbing sounds of this woman persisted. And despite the surprise, we were trying to stay rather calm. Like, this woman was just sobbing in the middle of nowhere, with nobody else around. Was there some stability in the middle of strangeness? Or was this a trap? None of it made sense. It all felt too terrifying and creepy. It didn't feel like someone who genuinely needed help. Why weren't they screaming for help, and why weren't they responded to my girlfriend and I's desperate calls? It was very out of place, to say the least. And as we make it to the shore and are looking around, we cannot really find the source of the crying. It sounded like it was all around us, left to right and below and above. There did not seem to be a definitive source or spot where the crying was coming from. Yet, we desperately kept yelling out, hoping we would get a response. And then, the crying started to distort and sound more natural, like crackly staticky radio interference. It was bizarre. And as quickly as it had erupted in the silence of the night, the woman sobbing just suddenly stopped and my girlfriend and I stood perfectly still like a statue in our tracks. In fact, we were so still, we probably looked like statues, listening for every little sound around us. Now it was quiet. You could have heard a pen drop from a hundred feet away. It was so silent. And you could feel the eeriness surrounding you in the air. Something was about to happen. I could feel it. I knew it. We were in danger and I think now we had just gotten ourselves into a trap. I have heard all sorts of horror-sick stories about people being lured in by human trafficking traps. You know, cribs and car seats left on the side of the road, hoping that some innocent bystander would stop and inspect, thinking that a poor innocent infant had been abandoned, left to the elements, only to be tricked and captured in God knows what. I was convinced we were going to die. But a sound had broken my thought bubble. A sound like a deep voice that I did not recognize, calling my girlfriend and I's name from not too far away. It was very calm and very drawn out. My girlfriend almost instantly let go of my hand and started sprinting back to the tent. I've never seen her run so fast in my life. I wasn't too long after her. Had we been back in high school... I think we could have easily beat everybody on the track team. We both just started packing up our stuff, not even wasting time, grabbing the small bucket of water we had and dousing the fire, hoping that the light of the fire would not draw whoever or whatever was out there. I think to this day, that is the fastest we have ever broken down a tent. And we threw everything in the back of the small car, and let's just say we sped out of there so fast that we had burnt the tires on the back end of the car. We drove about four or five miles down the road before pulling off and sleeping in the back seat together. Anything was better than being exposed out there by God knows what. And even though I'm much wiser and older now, and all that happened so many years ago, I still wonder who or what it could have been. At the time, 
I always thought it was somebody who was trying to lure us and trap us. But now that I'm a bit older and I've read more online, things about cryptozoology and other paranormal happenings, I almost wonder if maybe it was a skinwalker. Something that is able to disguise its voice and lure us, thinking somebody needed help when it somehow knew our names. Whatever it may be, and whatever my theory is, it or they were out there waiting for us. It was a trap after all. They were wanting to lure us in, and God only knows what would have happened if we came face to face with it. I've always prided myself in spending a lot of time outdoors and camping and hiking with friends. After all, the group I hang out with and spend time with really enjoy adventure, and we have this need of scaring the crap out of us every once in a while, so we'd often try and play pranks with one another. This event that I'm about to share with you only happened a couple months back. You can call me Rick. I'm 20 years young, and I was hiking around the Owyhee Mountains, which for a little geography lesson is in southwestern Idaho, and actually, it kind of goes into Oregon. It's a smaller tributary. I was with two friends, both male, who were around my same age. The area was actually ancestrally occupied by Shoshone and Bannock peoples, later inhabited by European settlers, the first fur sellers and even later miners. In fact, it was during the 1800s that gold and silver mining were exploited heavily in this area. Now, there are lots of empty ghost towns and settlements randomly and thoroughly dispersed. That's what we wanted to explore. All of these things just screamed adventure for young men like us. So, we decided to camp close by a hill just a few kilometers away from one of these ghost towns. While we don't mind sleeping in abandoned places, in the town, we saw graffiti and some modern conveniences. While it was empty, we decided to leave before the night. We also found several mutilated small animals, everything from hares to dead coyotes, and other strange animals, all torn apart, some with their guts torn out, others with limbs and body parts twisted and torn, others completely skinned and mangled. It reminded me of some sort of satanic ritual site. No way we'd sleep here. While it was fun to explore, there just was this eerie atmosphere that we didn't like. Maybe drug deals or rituals were going on here, but we didn't want to stay around and find out. Our protection we had with us was very limited, pretty much amounting to some knives and bear spray. It would not get us very far if we somehow got captured by wild hillbillies or mountain men from out here. So, while we were back at camp, we were just cooking, minding our own business and having some quiet chatter. We'd very frequently see shining lights, trying to debate on what it could be, and what was making it. It looked very strange and out of place. After all, we're kind of out in the backcountry, or so I like to say. There's really no settlements or houses out here, so it's pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. There's really no reason that lights should be flashing like this, at least not that I'm aware of. Then, we started to see more lights, off in the distance, but they were not in any particular pattern, just flashing in random order and random colors. We figured maybe somebody was having some sort of party, or we weren't sure. But again, we tried to ignore it. At some point, one of my friends who was dinking around on his phone decided to go pee by one of the trees. He quickly returned to us yelling, saying he saw something. We didn't believe him because we thought he was playing a prank on us. We asked him, What do you mean you saw something like that doesn't tell us anything? But he was very pale and didn't seem like he could really talk. He wasn't acting, and if he was, give the man an award. He spoke very fast and told us about a small hairy creature with a snout. He had got about halfway through his stream and saw this thing, peeking out behind a tree, watching him. Then, he heard movement from behind him and figured there was more of them, so he quickly cut it off midstream, zipped up and ran back to us. The man still had a little bit of dribble on his leg which I figured he must have really been in a rush, and he seemed really spooked. Very out of character for him. Me and my other friend kind of just laughed at him and told him to sit down and be quiet. We weren't going to buy his prank. Well, he sat down and just ignored us, 
kind of pissed off that we wouldn't believe him, but he was still really scared, really paranoid and kept looking over his shoulder. Eventually, me and my non-crazy friend got tired and decided to retire to our tents, telling our crazy friend who was staying up to watch out for the monsters, laughing at him and going to our tent. We fell asleep and slept like babies, actually. I'm pretty sure he retired to his tent, too, sometime much later. Maybe the fear and paranoia had finally worn off. In the morning, I awake to what I thought was my non-crazy friend yelling at me to come out here now. I thought something was wrong. I jump up out of my sleeping bag, running out there, and there's birds. Dead ones, all around our campsite. And their entrails are pulled all over the place. It was like a scene out of a horror movie. There had to have been at least a dozen, two dozen birds. Crows and ravens and blue jays. All sorts. And it looked like they'd all been put through a meat grinder. And I'll never forget it. My non-crazy friend just says, I think somebody's trying to tell us something. Yeah, we need to get out of here. It's not safe. So, I don't know if we were being driven out of there by crazy meth dealers, satanic worshippers, or monsters in the woods. Either way, we were terrified now. And we realized, we were all crazy. And if this was somehow a prank, it was sick. And anybody who would be willing to take a prank this far is seriously dangerous. We decided not to spend another second there, getting out of there very fast. We haven't gone back exploring their sense, but we've heard some stories, but nothing concrete. You have all probably heard of the Loch Ness Monster. I'm not going to get into whether it is real or not, but I will tell you a story of another, less famous monster. You are bound to believe because, well, it happened to me personally. See, I live in Boise. My entire state of Idaho is defined by nature and amazing landscapes, if you're willing to adventure out and see for yourself. I feel like Idaho, despite its politics, is very, very underrated. If you live here, you're likely to either be an outdoor person and fall in love with nature, or maybe you just like the political landscape. Anyhow, Something you must have heard at some point or another are the Rocky Mountains. Filled with a diverse amount of wildlife, the alpine lakes, and incredible landscapes. You probably heard of Payot Lake near McCall, Idaho, which is the place that I'm now going to tell you about. Now, while I was a kid and during my life, I've always heard the story of Charlie, which is supposedly Idaho's Payot Lake monster. It was one of those fun folklore legends you'd hear about. I mean, it was always talk. Some people claimed, like Bigfoot, to have their own sightings, but I think many people never really believed it. A lot of us just thought it was fun. And of course, like with Bigfoot, there are many firm believers who claim to have their own sightings and who swear that if you go into the great depths of the lake, you too will run into this creature that supposedly lives down there. So, even though a lot of people seem to believe that Shirley is real, there remains no actual proof for evidence. Like many Bigfoot encounters, there's nothing that you can hold on to. Other than maybe some miscellaneous tracks here and there, nothing really enough to prove its existence. However, there are a handful of fishermen that will tell you otherwise. Some of them report seeing a long serpentine-like creature resembling that of a dragon. Many of these men claim with their entire lives that what they saw was a real living creature. Now, I never said personally that it wasn't real, that I just never witnessed it myself. And for me to believe in something like that, I would definitely have to see it with my own eyes. I feel like most people are this way. So, one day, I myself had decided it was time to pay the lake a visit. As I've already mentioned above, I am very so much in love with nature, and I'm best when connected to nature itself. I love the feeling of home that the outdoors give me. It's not unlikely for me to go on expeditions. I've done it a million times before. The tranquility and peace that the outdoors give you is just something so serene. And I don't mind going there, again, just to unwind. Obviously, I'm not really a folklore believer. So, for me, there was nothing to be scared of. Or so I thought. When I got there, it was just as beautiful as I'd always remembered. 
The view was amazing, and it was enough to make you feel relaxed, almost right away. I took a short walk next to the lake, decided it was time to go home, as it was beginning to get a little chilly. As I began walking away from the lake, I began walking around it, just looking off into the lake and enjoying the scenery. When off in the distance, maybe about a couple hundred feet, maybe not even that close, I saw large ripples underneath the water, on the surface of the water, meaning something very large and very long was underneath, moving around. And I know there's no large fish or alligators or sharks in there, so what could it be in there that could be very long and slender? And my mind instantly went to Charlie. The ripples traveled quite a ways, and while this probably is not the story that you're looking for, of seeing some hideous lake monster emerge out of the water and shoot fire at me, which is obviously fake, this is more of a realization that something was large and right there under the water. It never broke the surface, but I could see enough from where I was standing that it was well over 40 feet. I really have no idea what other conclusion to come to, if you understand. After that, it seemed to quickly submerge back under the water, and the rippling was done for. Maybe, Charlie was actually a real living creature. In the next few days to come, I would reach out to some local fishermen whom I knew from friends and family, who would fish on that lake often. They all have their own stories of Charlie. One of them, whom I had lunch with, told me about his own encounter with her, after I told him what I'd seen. He acknowledged it, and told me yes, that is exactly what you saw. His claim was that early one summer morning, while he was out there, Charlie swam underneath his boat, and it came so close to the surface, he saw it for what it looked like, a large, dark green, dragon, serpent-looking creature, having almost spikes and tendrils poking at its sides. And he said while the creature looked hideous, it was beautiful and magnificent all at the same time. He was frightened due to its sheer size and length, but was not worried it was going to eat him or do anything that we would think lake monsters do. He has only ever seen it once. Another fisherman, who's fished at that lake a lot longer, goes by the name of Charlie. But Charlie has had several sightings of this thing, all of which were just like the other man, not aggressive in any way. And there's no trying to convince him that you've seen it. He knows full well that she conquers the lake. And I'll never forget him telling me, yep, it's her lake. That nobody messes with Charlie. We've heard stories here and there, but nothing ever violent or anything bad ever happening. Nobody capsizing their boat and falling in and being devoured by this large serpent-like creature. As far as he's concerned, if we leave it alone, she will leave us alone. And even now, I'm still blown away at the fact that it actually exists. It's sometimes kind of funny when you hear things going around your local area. This was something that was creepy right from the start. These past few weeks, I've been hearing about a man that we all know as Mr. Steven. Of course, that is just an alias, and not his real name. He's kind of an oddball in our small community, but lately, He's been proving to be more creepy than anything else. Apparently, his wife had passed away many years ago. He has no children, so he's kind of the only one. He's also very fond of guns. Kind of a serial killer, if you ask me. At least, I wouldn't be surprised. He comes off as the type of guy to have probably have hundreds of bodies buried somewhere, if you know what I mean. The real quiet type, bald head and glasses and it's constantly making trips out of Elk City. And he always acts super paranoid. It's very, very strange. He's even gone and put barbed wire up around his house, and some weird warning signs. There begun to get rumors spread around that Mr. Stephen had apparently kept some strange creatures chained up in the basement of his house outside of Elk City. And one day, my friends and I were hanging out in the park, when one of us brought up the idea of checking out what was in his warehouse. I was pretty against it, of course. We have no idea who Mr. Stephen really was, and it seemed very potentially dangerous. But after all of my friends ganging up on me, 
I had no choice but to give in to peer pressure. We waited until it was dark, and then we snuck out. We ended up taking my friend's car, driving out there. We didn't know the exact location, but we had a pretty good idea. He had spoken about the area and where he hunted many, many times. And we knew, to our knowledge, he wasn't there. There were six of us in total. How we managed to cram into my friend's small car is beyond me. It was like getting out of a clown car. And we all grabbed our flashlights. Everybody had their gear ready to scout out and look. We knew it had to have been close by. And after about 30 minutes or so, we're pretty sure we found it. I mean, with all the private property signs and dog warning signs and barbed wire fence posts, he kind of gave himself away. And if you're reading this, wondering how on earth we found out where it was so easily, he had always talked our ear off, all of us, for years, about the area and where his place was at, and how darn proud he was. What we found to be very strange, of course, was all of our flashlights died in unison the second we got near the house. We all just looked at each other and tried to turn them back on. They would not. We even tried replacing their batteries, and even then they acted faulty. We were not about to step in here in the dark. Well, fortunately for us, we had our phone flashlights. And that somehow worked. I don't get it either. My friend who just happens to be an expert picklocker, after playing Skyrim and being obsessed with playing the thief class. The kid actually got on YouTube and thoroughly learned how to pick locks, because this warehouse or farmhouse, whatever it was, only had a large padlock on the front that kept it locked, and he brought his little picklock kit with him and was picking the lock within minutes, had it open, so we ventured inside. It was pretty empty, and it stunk really bad, like moisture and like blood which only solidified to us that Mr. Stephen was indeed some sort of sick secret serial killer who would lure his victims up here and butcher them and probably bury them right? that's the typical story but this was not the case as we would soon learn after scouting around a short amount we found a small hatch in the door that led down to some stairs in the ground we all climbed down and realized that this was his basement. To the side was a large door that led out, probably to the back side of the building where stairs would descend down, leading to the same door from the outside. Inside, there were large cages covered and coated in blood and a smell of urine. Also, there was a disgusting rotting smell, like something had died in there. It was enough to make me and a few others gag, let alone nauseous. We heard something shifting in one of the cages, something moving and what we had swore were chains moving, and we had begun to hear a low growl. Everybody climbed on top of each other, trying to get back to the ladder to climb out. We were all too scared to venture and explore further, so we piled out, closing the hatch, piling out of the house, not even bothering to relock the padlock just running the entire way back to our car and leaving. One of us claimed it was the supposed goat man who they saw in the cage, but none of us even went over there to see what it was. But it sounded wrong, like it wasn't some sort of animal, and if you were to see that basement yourself and see all the blood and the way the cages were aligned and how large the cages were and what was up with the chains, they looked far too large to be keeping people down there. I don't want to go off on a tangent and say he was keeping monsters down there, but something was going on. Mr. Stephen had some sort of dark secret that he was keeping. It's just a matter of what. We weren't sure. My family is very active in terms of outdoor exploration and camping, uh, taking hiking trips and going on long walks and all other types of boring, exhausting things. So... While I was disappointed, I was not surprised that they had decided to want to take a hike during our winter vacation in Idaho. My mom bursting into the room with a new spot for us, the Oahe Mountains. I immediately let out a silent sigh under my breath. I just wasn't as interested in hiking as them. I'm not really an outdoorsy type of person. 
But nevertheless, because it was a family event, I had to go. We got our gear and put on our shoes, heading out the door. We spent, I don't know how long driving out there, but too long. Too long getting to the mountain. I napped in the car and when I awoke, we were there, parking the car, then getting out and making our way up this long mountain. There we were on our way. When we got pretty high, I would reminded myself not to look down. I had a very bad fear of heights, and I knew that looking down would cause me to freak out. I walked with my nose to the sky. I had to walk faster than I usually do to keep up with my family, who were professional speedwalkers. My mom and my sister were talking about something not important, when from behind them, and a bit ahead of me, her boyfriend Derek let out a yell. They looked behind them to see Derek with his foot in a rather large hole. He was hitting the ground with his clenched fist, trying not to scream again. It was obvious he was in very bad pain. We all stopped, my father and I pulling him out, then dragging him to the side, like a racing crew would do with a pit stop. We pulled up his pant leg and came to the conclusion his knee had instantly bruised the second it fell. The hole was large enough for his foot to have taken a second or so before it actually hitting the ground. We knew he would have trouble walking the rest of the way. My father and I put his arms around shoulders and took him back down the path. We were basically at the bottom when my sister began frantically patting her pant pockets. She put her palm to her face and let out a loud, aggressive sigh. What is it? My father had asked. The keys had fell out of his pocket up there. Me and my father looked at each other, realizing we were going to have to go up there and get them. We passed Derek on to my sister and mom and told them to just look back at the car and wait there. Derek insisted on going with us, assuring us that he would be fine and be able to walk again. But when he tried walking, he nearly fell over and broke his leg. My sister and mom rushed to him, holding him as we went up the mountain. We got there and began looking around. Fun trip already, he said smugly. And of course, I let out a fake laugh. I was looking down this time, but when we got high enough, I could not help but lift my head up to the sky. And to my surprise, all I felt was an arm hitting my shoulder with force. I stopped to see why my dad had struck his hand out like that, just looking down. Do you really want to make it two cripples on this trip? I looked down and saw that I was just about to step in the same hole that Derek had. Well, if this is Derek's hole, the keys can't be any further. Let's look around here. We looked around, and a little hole on the side of the mountain. Something shiny got our attention. I pointed it out to my father and he laughed, patting me on the back. Good eye, son, he told me. He got down, rolling up his sleeves, telling us to get out of here. He reached his hand into the mountainside. As soon as he put his hand in, he began screaming, pulling his arm out, and there was a lot of blood. While he held his hand there, I looked in the hole and saw something quickly jumping off the wall, leaping towards my father. I jumped forward and swatted at it. I watched it as it moved and writhed. It was a small creature. It was making these weird squirming sounds and I looked at my father and it flashed its teeth, snarling. Whatever this was, was not a normal creature you would see. We were now backed up into a corner, basically accepting our fate. When two hikers came down the mountain, smiling, looking at each other, and they looked ahead, their smiles disappeared instantly, and one of them pointed and screamed, and began running away. This caused the other to chase after. The four things sped after them, Maybe they smelt more fear on them. Assuming they smelt fear, but with those things, I wouldn't doubt it. Me and my dad stood a bit in fear, with my dad bleeding very badly. We had to make it down the mountain, now. I picked the keys up that my dad had dropped. We ran, as fast as we could, back down to the car. Insanely dangerous for going down steep paths, but we had no choice. When we made it, we had to get him to a hospital. Once we got to the hospital, that was a lot of fun, explaining to them what happened, but he just explained that he got bit by a raccoon or something. 
I can't remember the placeholder animal he inserted, but you get the idea. We don't really talk about it now, since my mom and other brother didn't see it. Only me and my father. It was still really creepy, and reminds me that there are things out there that we don't know. I would frequently go to my grandparents' home in Idaho. They lived in a small town, near the border of Montana. The town doesn't technically exist anymore. It was abandoned a while back, some years ago. Then it was kind of demolished for a refinery plant to be built in its place. As I said, I'd go there to visit sometimes. I was a kid, less than 10 years old. The town was mostly populated by older people, grandparents whose families would come and visit over the summer. Even though I didn't live there, over the years, I'd become friends with other kids who would come to town and spend time with their grandparents as well. My grandfather was one of the sweetest men I've ever met in my life. He used to work in lumbering and wood production when he was much younger. He had a shed behind his house. That's where he kept all his tools. He used to fix things and make whatever he or his neighbors needed. He was kind of the go-to guy in the neighborhood. You needed a tool? My grandfather had you. You needed something built? He had you. Whether it be something simple, like a birdhouse or even a tool, he could do it. He even built me a treehouse when I was little, and it was my favorite place to hang out and play with other kids. And my grandmother. Oh gosh, don't even get me started. She is still the best cook I've ever met. Also a very sweet lady. She used to be strict though sometimes. I think that whole generation is looking back. But she knew well what she was doing. They bought me a bicycle for my sixth birthday and even taught me how to ride it. My grandmother always hated it when I rode my bike to the edge of town, but she would never tell me why I was not allowed to go there. The entire town was pretty quiet, and there was not a whole lot of traffic, especially out there, where I went without her permission. It was not just me, though. My friends also loved to go there, even though their families, too, would not let them. So we would often ride together, and they would come to my house, wait for me to get out, and we would ride our bikes to that house. It was clearly abandoned. The fence, though, was still holding up, but the gate was always wide open. So, we would go there to play. About five or six of us. I don't know why we even insisted on going there in the first place. It's not like we had nowhere else to play. I guess it was the fact that we weren't allowed and that somehow makes it all the more appealing. Especially to a child. We'd go around noon or one and we'd always be home for dinner. This one time, we decided to sneak off to the abandoned house, as we usually did. We arrived, left our bikes by the fence, and started playing in the front yard. We were always cautious not to hit the windows or break anything with the ball. This time, we failed. I kicked the ball too hard. It went flying straight into the window on the side of the house, the glass shattering and our ball disappearing. It was now my job to retrieve it. Even though nobody lived there, I was still scared that I would get in trouble for breaking that window and getting inside without permission. The other five stayed outside and waiting for me, since I was the one that broke it. One of the boys, whose name I don't remember, had helped me climb in, squatting on the ground, and I stepped up on his shoulders, propping myself to reach the window. As I stumbled into the living room, I was hit with a stench of stale, musty air. Who knows how long it had been closed up. The smell was awful. I got up and dusted myself. I tried to find our ball, but it was nowhere to be found. I walked around the living room, moved the curtains to let in light, so it could be easier to find the ball, but still, no luck. I could hear the rest of the kids outside calling me to give them the ball. As I turned towards the kitchen to look there, I felt this gust of cold air brushing against my face. I moved over to the kitchen, and as soon as I stepped forward, the curtains, it previously opened up. I was the only one who had entered the house. I was there, frozen in my tracks. I couldn't see anybody, but the house had become very dark. My next step into the kitchen also caused another whoever closing the curtains to move towards the chair, which was on my right side. 
I could see the ball in the corner of the kitchen. I tried to ignore the chair moving and just get the ball and move right out. But as I moved to grab it, I went into full panic mode right then and there. I see this large, kind of cloudy, human shape that was all black moving towards me. Every step was a heavy thud, and it was moving at me very quick. I screamed back to my friends, running for the front door, remembering that it was locked, and I could not get it open, even from where I was at. I turned and the figure was now gone, but I could feel it in the room. It was this heavy, ominous presence. So I quickly, with the ball in my hand, ran back towards the window to where I'd climbed in at, and as I was climbing back up out the window, I could feel this shape, this figure, rushing back towards me. In a panic, I pushed myself out and nearly fell, breaking my thigh. I probably laid there for a few minutes, writhing in pain, as the shock of landing on my thigh was pretty painful. My friends and I all began to hear this rumbling, growling, roaring sounds coming from inside the house, and the sound of glass and things breaking and shattering. Whatever it was, was now angry that it did not get me. Angry that I had leapt out the window and escaped its wrath. I'll never forget the look on all my friends' faces. and They were wide-eyed and scared white, looking at the window, asking me, What did you see in there? I was so freaked out myself, I didn't have time to respond. I just told them, Come on, we gotta go. And we all jumped onto our bikes, riding away as fast as we possibly could. I didn't dare tell my grandparents what I did that day. Only years later did I finally even read about that place. It turns out that the man living there had had a psychotic episode one night murdering his entire family and nearly burning the house down. It's said that there was a demonic entity residing in that house. Was that what I had a one-on-one -on -one encounter with? Was whatever it was angry that I had entered into its palace? Even thinking back to it, makes my skin crawl. It's a memory that after writing this, I hope to permanently bury. I was at Yellowstone National Park with a couple of my friends. It was close to lunch, about 10 a.m. We were on our way to a family gathering. It wasn't my family. I was just invited. One of my friend's family apparently gather at Yellowstone for annual celebrations. As we're walking down a path, one of my friends spotted a rather large animal in the distance. We almost missed it if it wasn't the only black thing in the area. It was quite far from us and was mostly covered by the trees. I said it was big. It was half the size. My friends and I stopped and kept looking at it, and making sure it was really a creature after all. Our eyes might just be playing tricks. At first, we thought it could have been a bear, perhaps a grizzly or a black bear. But no. The longer we stared at it, the more we're able to make up its contours. It looked more like an ape. It was big and black and very, very hairy. Its arms were large and resembling that of a gorilla. It was steady and wasn't moving, so we decided to get closer. But only after advancing a few meters did it suddenly move. It moved across the trees and we're able to see it more clearly now, and see it walk like a man. It 100% resembled a notorious creature Bigfoot. Maybe it really was a Bigfoot. That thought kept repeating in my mind, but I guess I won't know, since it quickly disappeared among the tree canopies. We tried following it, but were unsuccessful. We arrived at the spot that we sought, and after looking around for some clue or footprint, we didn't manage to find one. The ground was covered with leaves and small grass, and the place smelt really bad, like rotten milk and eggs and must. It was bad, but it wasn't that strong. We were able to tolerate it. We headed back after that. We're all very dejected at the time and kind of down, since we just missed this big opportunity. It might have been a Bigfoot, it might not have. Either way, we saw it and that's exactly what it looked like. Later on, we tried searching and scanning the surrounding area for maybe more clues, but nothing had come up, so we decided to head back. On our way, I saw particular scratches on a large tree, branches very high up that were broken. Then it clicked. 
what stands this high up that could break these branches off at about 9 or 10 feet up? And the large scratch marks. I know bears will sometimes scratch tall parts of trees, but at 10 feet off the ground? It didn't make sense. I didn't know enough about Bigfoot to know if they had claws or not, but something seemed different. Looking closer at the tree and inspecting, the claw marks were very deep, deep indentations into the wood, and very, very wide apart. Not to mention, the claw patterns were unrecognizable, not like a bear, which are very recognizable, and it was more fresh. I took some pictures, but didn't really feel they were worth sharing. I mean... It's not like you could look at them and really tell what it could have been. We spent a little more time searching around the area in hopes to find anything or any sort of evidence. Maybe like a scat pile or a hair sample. Something that would give us a lead to know that for sure this was a Bigfoot. And funny, before this day, I never really thought twice about it. I mean, growing up in modern day and age, you always hear things about Bigfoot, but it's more of a joke, you know for laughs, but to actually see something that resembles some sort of Bigfoot-like creature, it makes you wonder what else is out here, and it makes me wonder if that is what we really saw that day. I can remember this. It was a Friday night. I was heading home after a long shift at work. I hated my job, and I hated the hours that I was forced to endure. I understand I could quit at any time, but I really needed the money. So, anyway, I was driving by Overland Avenue, Burley, Idaho. I can tell you the street was quiet at the time. No pedestrians. No noise. In fact, it was eerily quiet. There were very few cars on the road. I found it odd. After my phone ringing, I picked it up and realized it was from my daughter. After I glanced at my phone initially, I turned my attention back towards the road. I was quite surprised when I see two red lights. Off in the distance, I found it odd, since the light was kind of moving and glowing in a weird way. I thought it was the back taillights of a car, but it wasn't. And it was fast approaching me, and I realized that those two red lights were much closer together than initially thought, and my headlights exposed it showing a body. It was some sort of human, or a humanoid, but with four arms. And its body was thick, like a large fur coat. And that's when I screamed because I noticed there were wings attached to its back. The wings were fleshy-like, kind of like that of a bat, and easily ten plus feet in length. As for the head, it was more just a large body with these two ominous glowing red orbs coming from the center. And instinctively, I slammed on the brakes, slowing down and ducking down as to not be seen. I thought that this thing was going to smash against my windshield, but the creature quickly flew above my car, and I could hear its wings powerfully flapping. I drove my car the moment it passed. I promise, I was not and am not under the influence of any substance, alcohol, or anything that could cause possible hallucinations. I was clear-headed, awake, and alert. While I was physically tired, there was nothing that came in the way of me seeing something that was not there. I know what I saw, and it scared me. I even told this story to my family and coworkers. They laughed me out of the room. And of course, no one believes me. I stopped using that route altogether, deciding to use a different one. The new one I take is longer to get home. I've done that for about a week now, and gave up. Whatever I saw that night, the thought of it sends terror into my body. Thinking I somehow encountered a demon or something, or maybe some sort of large gargoyle, I try to do some research, only to come to the conclusion that what I saw is what a lot of people refer to as the Mothman. Which is strange. I'm in Idaho State. Nowhere near Point Pleasant, West Virginia. So the fact that people would even see something like this, let alone see it here, is unexplainable at best. Now, I'm very careful which routes I take and which way I use to get home. I try and take the really long route now. 
It does add an extra 12 minutes of driving time, but it's worth it. As long as I don't encounter that thing again, or ever have to look into those eyes. Before I tell you my story, I should give you a little bit of background on I. I'm German, born and raised. My family did not have a lot of money growing up. We had everything we needed, but nothing more. This is also why we never traveled or did anything extraordinary. I had visited Belgium, the Netherlands, and France just a couple of times, but that was it. As you probably know, traveling is expensive, but I've always really missed out on a lot of experiences. All my friends would talk about it. I've dreamt of visiting the United States, and that's why, when I was 16, I decided to start saving up some money with the job I did whenever I had the time. I don't know where I wanted to go in the States or who I would go with, but that really wasn't important. I just wanted to see a little bit of the world, without feeling restricted financially, of course. I only saved up enough money when I ended university. And before you say anything about school being expensive, this is not the US. School doesn't cost as much over here, and I got a scholarship on top of that. I was a very exceptional student. I studied hard to become a history teacher. I like to think that that was a good excuse to spend all my money on traveling. How can you teach people about the world and its history when you have not seen any of it? I didn't know where I wanted to go just yet, so I tried to do some research. Even before I began university, I decided where I would go. I wanted to go to Idaho State. It's beautiful, lots of nature the Kirkham Hot Springs and the old Idaho Penitentiary. Germany is beautiful and full of nature, but not that much where I lived. So I wanted to take the opportunity and enjoy it as much as I could. I went with two of my best friends and my big sister. We also visited Montana State, but that was after what happened to us. We planned on going for three weeks. We rented a car and went our way. It was a lot of fun. The U.S. is very different than that of Germany. Completely different culture. And the people were so nice. Maybe a bit too much, even. We decided to go camping in the Salmon Chalice National Forest. It's a forest in Idaho and a beautiful place to be. Our plan was staying there for two days. We would have the time of our lives, or so I thought. I could not have imagined what we would witness in the forest. On our first night there... We were all very tired, so we went to sleep early. I shared a tent with one of my friends, my sister and my other friend, both having their own tents. I didn't think that would be the best idea, considering how dangerous nature can be at night. Also, I had heard enough true crime stories to not feel completely safe anywhere, let alone in a forest. They didn't care, however. Not as superstitious and paranoid as I am, not too far away from us, though, there's a couple. A man and a woman who had shared a tent. They looked pretty weird and freaked me out a little bit. I just had the strange feeling they were unwanted there. They were bothering them in some way. I was mostly the woman who looked pissed off. Often, when we were getting louder. We didn't let it bother us too much, though. It took me a while to fall asleep that night. And my friend was long gone. I didn't have anybody to talk to, so I put on my headphones and listened to some relaxing music until I felt myself dozing off. I was awakened pretty quickly, though, by the howling of some large animal. It sounded very close by. My friend woke up, too, and looked kind of scared. The howling in and of itself wasn't really scary, but it gave me this weird feeling. Unsettling, actually. I decided to take a look. I was pretty curious. I have never seen a wolf up in close anyway. I didn't see one right away, so I figured it must have gone. I looked at the other tents, and my sister was also looking out for the tent, and to my surprise, I saw the weird lady standing outside, next to their tent. The man wasn't there, though. She turned around and looked at me straight in the eyes and began screaming that I had to get back in my tent, minding my own business. My sister took that as a sign to start screaming at this woman, 
uh, calling her all sorts of obscenities and other profanities. A loud growling sound now made both of them go silent. The three of us turned around to face the woods. We had heard the sound was coming from. I finally saw it. It looked like a wolf, but was larger. Larger than expected. Way bigger. I also imagined them to be much more beautiful creatures, but that was not the case for this one. Both of my friends were now taking a peek outside. Even though I had never seen one in real life, I knew this wasn't an ordinary one. It was scary looking. I admit, I expected him to attack one of us, but instead, it just focused on the one woman. They made eye contact for an uncomfortable amount of time. When I looked at her, I expected to see some sort of fear in her eyes, but she was smiling. It was creepy. I didn't understand why I just stood there, watching and growling. At some point, he or it turned around and disappeared. I had heard it howling a bit further away. It's safe to say that we didn't sleep again that night. We left in the morning, instead of staying for another night. Could it have been a werewolf? I'm not sure. We all thought that, though. There was no way it was a normal wolf. Wolves, from what I know, don't look like that. They don't stand like a man. I can't help but think the man who disappeared had something to do with it. That was the animal, and the woman stared at each other was not normal. Idaho isn't known for much. In fact, it was hardly known at all. And before I moved there, I'd have bet my sole functioning kidney that it was somewhere on the eastern side of the United States. And if not for his mother's worsening health, I'd have never agreed to move to the middle of nowhere. We moved in winter. Big mistake. It was cold and boring as I'd originally expected. It got to the point where I'd stare off into our backyard with a mug of something warm, fantasizing about a visitor lurking amongst the trees. Sometimes it crept along the length of grass, watching me, as if I thought I'd gone mad. Other times it held its ground from the tree line. Scott always accused me of staring at nothing and playing up the stir-crazy act to make him feel bad. I hated to agree with him, but... The only thing that was there was a deer, and it moved on after a few days. Now, Scott was a rather pale man. Maybe it was the Idaho winter, and maybe it was just his natural complexion and color. Maybe it was just complete lack of sun. He often looked jaundiced and had bags under his eyes, no doubt from sleepless nights. His hair always looked greasy and unkempt, like if you were to run your fingers through it. They'd be covered. Disgusting. Some days, I was set free of the backyard's hold, and instead, I explored the town where my husband had grown up, where I was used to skyscrapers and busy streets. The most interesting thing in the town square was the gossip. My introduction was more like a crash course as I found out that a Mr. Richardson, a good friend of my mother-in-law's, had come up missing a few days back. While I was busy wondering what the police had to say about the situation, everybody else was going on and on about some thing called the Widowmaker, and for a moment, I was floored. A man was missing, and they were telling ghost stories. But the longer they talked, the more it felt as if some part of their words was tickling my brain. They went on and on, and talking over one another, trying to describe something that they famously referred to as having long arms, leathery skin. It was all too much for me personally. Too improbable, but I supposed even simpler folk needed their entertainment. So I left them to it the moment it was polite. Maybe if I had listened. There's no sense in wondering about it now, but knowing that it didn't help make things easier have I stopped. If I'd just taken five stupid minutes to listen to them, instead of running them off as backwater hicks, then maybe my life would have come out different. Either way, I went home after I finished my exploring, all tuckered out from the endless fairy tale introspection. I was eager to get back to my favorite porch, where I would sit and gaze upon the beauty of nature in the middle of nowhere. Something that had become very ritualistic for me. I would sit there with my mug, settling into my wooden rocking chair, 
getting comfortable as the sun began sinking below the trees. There was a cool breeze blowing by the time that I had fired up my cigarette, lost in thought and contemplation. The light was soft and gentle now, cutting through the trees in a perfect way that made it look almost inviting, like there was something calling me closer and closer. The evening was beautiful, and I had more than ample time to enjoy it, as my eyes were now drawn towards the tree line. Something was there, something moving at arm's length on the grass. And now, after seeing something, my heart leapt into my throat, and I screamed, but it kept coming towards me. Long arms, dangling from the body, giving this thing an almost sloth-like appearance, the body being a dirty gray color, its face being round and large and flat, and having almost non-existent features, except for two deep black holes made for the eyes. I watched and frozen in fear as it approached, long arms reaching out to me. It rushed me, and the trance I was usually so trapped in shattered. My mug nearly missed the thing, but I'd hardly noticed as I ran for the door. My heart pounded with the need to escape, but its long arms made it easy for him to catch me by the throat. Its skin was smooth as my snakeskin bag, but its grip was inescapable. I didn't feel like I could scream or squirm, but I knew that some part of me knew that whatever was coming was worse than death. The Widowmaker is said to be found in the deepest parts of towns, cities, and even among the trees. Sometimes it lurks, other times it moves along the tall grass, watching you as if waiting for the right time. It has a number of ways that it chooses its victims, but the most common is coming after via strangulation. However, there is speculation it has a preference of women, so it will try and creep into the homes while they are sleeping. It is also said that if you see it, you can die of a heart attack. And apparently it's responsible for a number of missing person cases in rural Idaho and surrounding states. This is a creature that too many are afraid to talk about. And too many times, people will try and rationalize the disappearances as being caused by natural forces. I believe it's a part of the supernatural world, a place humans were never meant to be involved in. As for this creature, after strangling me, it let me go, leaving a strange black marker on my neck. I don't think it was trying to kill me. I think it was trying to mark me. So I wanted to write this and find out if anybody knows anything about the Idaho Widowmaker, as I try and put this traumatic memory and experience behind me. Bigfoot certainly lives in Idaho State. See, a while back, I was camping in my crowded backyard. Lots and lots of trees. This is the very first time that I ever saw him. He was well over eight feet tall, covered in dark fur, much like that of a bear. At the time, I hadn't been able to see him clearly from my position, of where I was beneath the brush. If I'd been paying any less attention, I'd have mistaken him for a large bear. The second time, it had been wholly intentional. I had laid out a very large plate of older apples that I'd picked from an apple tree, and I lied in wait. While I stayed back and hid in the brush, it looked like something large moving behind a few trees, and possibly getting closer. After a few more hours, I got tired and went back inside. The next morning, the pile of apples that I had laid on the ground were now completely gone, no trace of them left. Obviously, I guess I must have given Bigfoot a peace treaty, and after this, I've kept giving my peace offerings, laying out as many apples and pears as I can, since near my house, there are many apple and pear trees. I always consider it a gift, or, as I've said, a peace treaty. If Bigfoot does exist, and it sounds like he does, there's no telling what he can do to me, ripping me in pieces or breaking into my house, eating me. I know nothing about how Bigfoots act, and I don't even know who I'd reach out to to find an expert on them. So I just continuously offer them apples and pears to hopefully try and keep them at bay. It seems to be working for the time being. Maybe I could use this as a way to get a picture, but they're still very stealthy and only do it at night. 
I'll see what I can do about setting up a GoPro where the apples are, and trying my best to get something. Wish me luck. Year 2018. My friend and I were promoted to manager of our respective department. To celebrate our success, we decided to go camping. It was for one night only. We had decided to go to Lake Cascade State Park in Idaho. As we reached there with our jeep, nailing up our tents, we were grooming those freshly hunted fishes on the barbecue. Sitting behind the small fire we lit, chit-chatting, and the view was unexplainable. The moonlight bouncing off face of the lake and the dark and dense groups of trees was giving us a sense of relief. When I got to pick some stuff from the jeep, I had this illusion of seeing something on the shore of the lake, far ahead. However, I went ahead with to our campsite. After we finished our drinks, a lot of time had passed to just sitting on stones and doing nothing. We decided to go and sleep inside of our tent. After all, we were pretty bored and didn't have much left to do. When I was cleaning up the empty drink cans, one was thrown at me by my friend, asking me to collect that one too. However, the can missed me, and it fell far behind me near the bushes. I ran there searching for it, but it was quite dark. I did not bring my torch. Anyhow, I found the can and, suddenly, I had heard some noise in front of me. It seemed like rustling of bushes, but I saw something shining into them, looking like eyes. I was shook, thinking it was some wild animal, but the eyes suddenly disappeared just when I realized I had to get the jeep. I was already running, all irrational thoughts of being eaten alive by whatever this animal could have been. And my friend shrieking in the distance. I could see him. When I went to him, he said that there was some animal running past him. I think at this point, we took it as our hint to try and get out of here. We clearly were not welcome. Something did not want us here. And sure enough, everything around us went deadly quiet. It was eerie. There was the sound that sounded like rustling, again in the bushes, going to the trees. We could see the trees in the distance shaking violently, as if a bear was strangling an oak tree. It felt like lightning was about to shoot down on us. After packing, we bombed ourselves to the jeep and began starting the engine, and this creature leaping in front of the vehicle, with a face as leathery and disgusting as an old dried-out football. Large black eyes and a mouthful of tiny teeth and several large fangs. This thing was also frail and emaciated looking, like a starved Holocaust survivor. Long lanky limbs and dark claws. I threw the jeep in drive, flooring it, nearly running him over. But he was so quick, I didn't even see him dart out of the way. It was like he wasn't even there, blowing my mind. At a speed that didn't even seem possible... The next thing you know, he was just a blur. Nothing. I begin to lose all senses over my body as I'm flooring the jeep, driving. My legs and hands become numb, and now my vision is becoming blurry. I pull the jeep over and try to recollect, but my vision is getting so bad, I feel like I'm going to fall unconscious. My friend pulls me out of the seat, quite literally, plucking me up from the driver's seat and putting me in the back where I lose consciousness. I guess they were able to drive us back while we had left everything at our campsite. They were considering taking me to a hospital until I came to. With this very strange burning sensation that I get now all over my hands and legs at random times, it's never gone away. I still deal with it nowadays. It's just not as often. But sometimes I'll have these days where it's really bad and I have to pop quite a few ibuprofen to make it stop. I have no idea what that thing did to me, but whatever it did, it really messed my life up. This happened a few years ago now. My three brothers and I, the avid teenage explorers that we were, had gone camping near Lake Cascade. We had just finished setting up our tents near the lake directly across from the mountain road. We were eating fried fish sticks and we had brought other food. Our pickup truck, was parked near the tent. We had left the majority of our supplies in it. The little that we had bothered to stuff our backpacks with 
consisted of flashlights and some other snacks and food. Now, it was nearing 8 p.m., so we thought what a better time to take turns telling horror stories. Just the classic camping ones. Ghosts and ghouls and goblins. Bigfoots and bears. All the fun stories that make you squirm. This had been our first trip in a while, due to exams and assignments and other school-related activities. We just wanted to relax and be away from home for just a couple of nights. We had been going on trips like this ever since Marty, the eldest of us, had turned old enough to drive. And we still do. Not as frequently, of course, but we do. In all our camping history, we had never encountered many wild animals. So, we had always been pretty lax about security. That's never a great idea. By the time it was Sam's turn to start his story, we were already bored. Sam was the youngest, and his stories were always a modified version of some outdated creepypasta. I was pretty tired, since I had done most of the work in setting up the tents. I was struggling to keep my eyes open. As he went on about this long old haunted doll story, which was obviously a ripoff of Robert the Doll, I laid down, resting my back. It ached, and I could really do with a shot right now. I probably would have just gone to sleep, and then we heard a screeching noise. It shot me up out of my drowsiness. My drowsiness vanished, actually. We all looked up towards the lake. It was pretty dark, so we couldn't see much. Marty suggested that we go look. What, are you kidding me? This is not a horror movie. We're not going to go get slaughtered. It's a terrible idea. None of us are armed. I think the most we have is a pocket knife. Hardly enough to even defend ourselves with adequately. Screams in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's going to end well especially at night. I've seen far too many horror movies to know that the following is never a good idea. Then, the shriek came yet again. It was longer this time. The sound was not too clear due to the wind, but it reminded me like the voice of a woman. Despite my reluctance, we decided to grab our flashlights and go look. It could have been a traveler in trouble, and as a precaution... I grabbed a steel rod that we had left over from setting up the tents. I hadn't known what its purpose was, but it would have a new one now. We walked with our flashlights towards the lake, but there was nobody in sight. The shriek sounded once more. It seemed to be coming from nearby. Now that it was more clear, I could make out the word being screamed. Somebody was calling for help. We increased our pace and began calling out for the woman. We still could not see anybody, which was weird, since judging by our speed, whoever it was, she should have been visible by now. As we continued pacing towards the lake, calling out for her, the light from my light fell on a strange being. Everybody saw it, causing all of us to stop dead in our tracks. It was far more human than animal, crawling around on all fours, like the way a toddler would not taller than three feet tall. Its body was yellow and completely naked, devoid of any genitalia or hair, and the head was disproportionately larger than the body. The face was distorted, eyes completely black, pretty much no nose and a very, very large mouth. It stared at us for a minute and then slowly made a grinning expression, exposing millions of tiny teeth, much like that of a piranha. I took a step back instinctively, tightening my grip on the rod, but it did not move or attack. Instead, it grinned wider, looking towards the sky and shrieking. It was the shriek of a woman, calling out the word help, and every hair on my body stood up. I can't speak for my friends, but I'm sure they were like me, at their wit's end, about to release the bowels in their pants. We all yelled and cursed, running back towards our tents. I don't know if this thing was a flippin' animal, a ghost, an alien, a demon. I don't know. I didn't care. All I knew is that it did not belong in our world. It had no place with us. We quickly grabbed our bags, left our tents, and got in the car, driving away. It took us quite a while to calm down. We had discussed what we had just seen. This thing was straight out of a horror movie. It was unlike any known animal. 
I say it was unlikely any known animal, since I have scanned through pretty much the entire internet, looking for any information on it. I can't find a thing. The next day, we decided to go back with our uncle and father, who each carried a shotgun. We were looking around for it. Maybe we could capture it. My dad has seen some pretty weird stuff, especially out in the Sawtooth Mountains. He's heard some things. He had no qualms about believing us and was actually excited for the trip. My uncle, too, loved adventure and had nothing better to do, so he tagged along, but was much more open-minded and not so believing. We searched for hours. We could not locate it or even find anything out of the ordinary. We went home empty-handed. A few months go by, and my brothers and I returned to the spot. But once again, we could not find it. I hear the lake now has been closed down due to excessive bacteria. The creature, perhaps more of them, probably still reside in the area. It mocked us. It wanted to kill us. I have not been able to find anything related to it. Out of all the hours I've spent scouring the internet. I don't know if it's dangerous, but if its teeth give me any signs, I'm sure it is. And the fact that it can mimic a human and show intelligence... It's very, very terrifying. If you saw what I saw, you would agree with every word about the story that I'm about to tell you. My name is James. I used to be a farmer of Idaho. I was taking the weekend to be with my family. Saturday, actually. We had gone to Greenbelt Park, having a picnic. With me was my small daughter, my wife and my younger son, my older son lives in New York now with his family. After the picnic ended, we decided to go to Snake River for some photos. Some hours had passed and we had to return home to be ready for Sunday. In the morning, our day was pretty busy. We prepared our bags to visit a very famous place, the Payette Lake, known by many as the Lake of Charlie, a supposedly a sea monster-like serpent. The stories around this creature are told since the 1950s. It was named by a newspaper contest. My son and daughter were packing their bags. I and Samantha were packing ours. Then, after loading everything in the car and closing the door, arriving there, we saw a crowd publicly celebrating Charlie's Day at the lake, waiting for the appearance of the famous creature. Sure, this serpent only appeared decades ago and some of us thought that it was just a story or something like that. But most people, at least that I saw, truly believed on its existence. Hours passed and we were all looking to the lake, waiting for something to happen. Maybe the government prepared something fun for Charlie's Day. We waited, but at the end of the festival, nothing happened. No monster appeared. My daughter was disappointed. My wife was bored just like me and... Bill was playing with his cell phone. Before we leave the lake, I saw something, though, moving in the water. I had no idea what it could be. Maybe a snake or a fish? Are there such things as lake snakes? I don't know. I asked if my family saw the same thing that I was. They didn't see it. We began going back to the car, and we heard a huge sound. It sounded like waves. I turned back, and I started hearing everybody including my family and all the people around us, freaking out at what we had just seen. Something had just emerged from the water, and then quickly went under. Although, it happened so fast, it makes you wonder. This was in the wintertime of 2000. I remember it like it had just happened the other day. I was spending the remainder of my holidays visiting family in Colorado. Let me give you a little bit of the layout of their land. My family lived outside of a smaller town. Their back was a massive stretch of land that moved into a small mountain. Tons of Colorado aspens everywhere. If you happen to catch it all in the fall, like October, the scenery was something of another world. Hues of gold, or brown and red, would shine. It was truly magnificent. And even in winter's cold, it was still a very beautiful place to spend your time. While my time coming up in the fall was not often, I would mainly spend it after Christmas, 
New Year's Eve and even the first week or so of January, relishing my time with relatives who I would not see very often. Their house was custom built. Everything was big. At the back, you had a detached garage with a wraparound driveway. On the other side of that, you had a very large woodshed and other miscellaneous gardening tools. Next to that was a stump and a wood splitting mall resting right up against it, and a conveniently placed hatchet for kindling. If you were to go on the other side of the house, on the other piece of land, which was almost like a conjoining piece of property, but they owned it all, was a building they were in the process of redoing. I'm not sure if it was meant to be a guest house or what, but I never went inside of there. All I knew is it was in the process of being renovated, so I never asked. Beyond that, the land slowly ascends up into a large hill, which I believe is back to a small mountain, but I'm not quite sure. All throughout is full of aspens, intermixed with a beautiful Colorado meadow. Their house is almost like a half a million dollar home, very large and very wood cabin-like, although I feel like calling it a wood cabin is probably an insult. That would be like calling a Lamborghini a Honda, because they're both cars. While visiting, my family ought to make it my duty to go back there and split wood for us as often as possible. Oftentimes, I'd be back there for two, three hours a day, splitting up wood over and over and stacking it. It was not only to fuel wood for the house, but just to help out family, as my family was getting older and more tired. They were not able to keep up on the load. I hated doing it, but what else could you do? I could not argue. While out there, completely by myself with my splitting mall, getting wood, I would often see this man-like figure drifting behind the aspens in the evening time, probably right around 4 or 5 p.m., as it was getting darker. Maybe sooner than that, because in the winter time, the sun sets about 4 or 4.30 and is dark pretty early, so it was probably closer to 3 to 4. The sun was setting, but not quite dark yet. It would always move very slowly, from east to west, never minding me or anything else around. It used to really creep me out. The animal or figure was much like a larger man, built and lean in the chest, but very skinny and slender in the waist and the legs. It was a smoky gray color. The legs, which I thought were weird, were very similar to a man, and even though the head was very large and very similar to that of a wolf or a dog, the legs were not like a dog's. They had no hocks, and they bent at the knee. It kind of looked like somebody crawling around on all fours with a large dog head mask on or something weird. It was a strange sight, and it always creeped me out. I wouldn't see it every evening, but I saw it often enough that it really gave me a bad feeling. And so finally one evening, I was doing my usual. Actually, this time, I believe I had the hatchet and was getting pieces of kindling from a small round. And I look up and I see this thing again, almost drifting, just behind the trees as if not wanting to be seen. Then it stops and slowly arches its back and head in my direction and very robotically puts itself up on two legs. Right when this happened, fear overtook my being. I did not feel safe. I did not know what this was. It was certainly not a bear, and it was not a wolf. There's no known animal that I'm aware of that behaves in this fashion. I simply and calmly put the hatchet down, while never breaking eye contact, and made my way back into the house. Of course, I never explained to my family what I was feeling, I just vaguely told them I didn't feel well and I was a little nauseous. They informed me I should probably lie down and maybe it was the bad roast we had earlier in the day. All jokes aside, it wasn't until later that I briefly spoke up about it to some of my family. I even asked them if we can keep the lights on just to feel safer. Surprisingly, I wasn't mocked. They had heard me out and seemed genuinely concerned, which is more than I could ask for any family. With something like this, I would have expected to be mocked, but they took me seriously, at least from what I could tell. 
The next day, my grandfather even pulled me aside and spoke with me in the evening time. I was going to go out and split wood for the evening, but he had stopped me and told me to be very careful. He informed me that they come out during the evening. I basically played 20 questions with him trying to find out what he meant by they, but he wouldn't answer, or if he did, they were indirect, answering in riddles. I feel that he did this to protect me, like he didn't want me to know the truth, but he could not hide it anymore now that I knew these things existed. I never really got answers, was just told to be very careful, and watch my surroundings, which I did. I saw them a few more times, and I tried my best to ignore it and just shove it off. The rest of my time there and my family's proved fairly uneventful. Whatever these things were, they never made a move on me, and they just kept to their path of going east to west almost every other evening, or so it seemed. Always the same trail, too, behind these set of aspens. After this year, I would not go visit again the following winter. But the winter after that, two years now from the original one, I would come back and there was no trace of them, or so I remember. So I really don't have a logical explanation of what they were, or what I think they were. My grandfather and family would never talk about it, nor would they ever answer my questions. I really have nothing to say about it. But after some time, I stopped coming to my family visits, for fear that eventually these things would return. So, I'm from Edmonton, Canada. I'm a student and still live at home with my parents and two younger brothers. We're all pretty adventurous and love nature. We spend a lot of time outdoors. We go hiking every weekend and camping every now and then. As a student, I don't really have the time to go camp as often as I would prefer, sadly. I want to be a veterinarian. About three years ago, before I was a college student... I had more time to myself. We had gone camping for a couple of days. My family is very down to earth. We never believed in supernatural things, like the paranormal. We were all very aware of nature and its dangerous aspects. In fact, learning about plants and animals has been a large part of our upbringing since, a very young age, my parents wanted us to be safe at all times. Also, a connection to nature is incredibly important for human beings, too often overlooked. I can only advise everybody to reconnect with nature when you're not feeling great. I promise you that it helps. Now, back to my story. That weekend we went camping in Jasper National Park. It takes a couple of hours to get there, but it's absolutely worth the drive. The park is gorgeous. It's the perfect hiking spot for every nature lover out there. You do have to make a reservation, and you can't just camp anywhere in the park. I recommend Wilcox Creep Campground. The first day, our hike went great. The weather was nice, and the view was beautiful. We were really tired after, so we went to sleep pretty early after a light dinner. The day after was a bit different, though. As soon as I woke up and left the tent, I felt like I was being watched. This feeling had continued throughout the day, but whenever I looked around, I never saw anything. FYI, I'm never scared to go when camping. There's no reason to be. I know how to get out of dangerous situations. I'm a pretty big guy, and not to brag, but I consider myself quite strong. However, that day, I didn't feel at ease at all. We all know what feeling watched is like, and often, you'll see somebody actually watching you when you look around. This was not the case, though. After a couple of hours of walking, me and one of my brothers were walking behind the rest of my family. I decided to ask him if he felt watched at any point throughout the day. I wanted to know if I was crazy or not. To my surprise, he said yes. He told me that, like me, he had felt somebody was watching us. I was glad to know I was not alone. When we got to finish our hike that day, we sat around the campfire and played some games. It was fun. I forgot about everything for a little while. 
when we decided to go to sleep a couple of hours later, the feeling came back. I shared a tent with my brothers, so I could not take out a reading light to distract myself. After all, I was not tired at any bit, so I would not be able to fall asleep. I closed my eyes and began counting in my head. This is something I often do to try and fall asleep. When I got to around 300, I heard something right outside the tent. It was like a very loud breathing. It sounded like an animal, but I hadn't heard one breath like that before. I was trying to identify what I was hearing when I felt my brother move in his sleeping bag. I asked him if he was awake, and he answered with a quiet yes. He asked me if I knew what it was. I told him I did not. We both heard the animal approach, and I began to get a little uncomfortable. I sat up, and my brother did the same. I really wanted to know what it was. I decided to slightly open the tent to look outside. It was one of the best and worst decisions of my life. A bit further away from our tent, I see this giant creature standing between some trees. When I say standing, I mean standing on two legs, like a human. It was so big, way bigger than any human I'd ever seen in my life. It was dark, and I couldn't make out all the details. All I knew is that its head and face were not human. It looked more like a wolf or a dog. I could not believe what was happening. It was watching me closely. It was watching us. After seconds go by, my brother asked me if there was anything out there, but he was a little too loud. I think it startled this thing. It immediately turned around and started running away from us, and it was very fast. I didn't expect that big to be so quick. I told my brother about it, but he did not believe me. Neither did my parents when I told them in the morning. I can say that I have never heard about a dogman before, but I stumbled upon the stories about this creature when I was trying to do some research. I had heard of Bigfoot and other mythical creatures, but this was completely new for me. I'm convinced that this is what I saw that night. I know I don't want to sound unbelievable, and I'm sure I was not daydreaming. I do not want to encounter it again, but I'm kind of happy I did, although I don't know if that makes any sense. I hope more people have stories about a dogman. I would love to hear them. I want to know that there are people out there who've experienced the same thing as me so I don't feel as crazy. So, me and a couple of friends of mine were hanging out by this abandoned elementary school in Wexford County. The school has four floors. We were outside by the playground, or what used to be the playground. It was around 5.30, give or take. We always hung out there during the day since one of our friend had a curfew. But, after his birthday, which was a couple of days, and his parents became less strict, so we got to hang out there just a little bit late. Anyway, we're smoking, having a really good time, you know. It was a little creepy since it was an abandoned school and everything, but other than that, it was normal. We were planning on staying until around 7, just for the thrill, I guess. At some point, we wanted to see some scary stuff. It was still a little bright outside. The sun was still up. So, me and a few friends decided to start a fire. We're not going to make a huge one, just a little one to use as light. One my friend Jerry volunteered to go inside one of the classrooms and find something, anything we could burn. A couple of minutes after heading inside, we heard a very loud bark and we saw Jerry running back. He was panicking. His face was pale and everything. Then, just behind him, we see this large black canine. At least, that's what it looked like. Almost like a wolf. It was covered in wounds. It was bloody and had grayish skin underneath, kind of like an upright wolf with mange. At the sight of this huge animal, we all almost instinctively ran in opposite directions. I've never felt this scared before. I mean, my heart was beating out of my chest. I ran as fast as I could, and I noticed my friends on the corner of my eyes as we ran. After a while, 
I looked back to see if it was catching up. It was still in the same spot that we saw running towards Jerry. It must have stopped after seeing us. I kept looking at it as I walked backward, but my friends, who were already far ahead of me, I turned back towards the huge dog, only to catch it now standing up. I could not believe what I was seeing. I saw this dog thing standing on two feet, now looking at me. We had a stare for a while before it growled, crouching down again. In my mind, I thought it would run after me, so I turned around and ran as fast as I could. I managed to catch up to my friends, and they were waiting for me. I did not even spare them a glance. I only wanted to run away from that place as fast as I could. We came out by a roadside, crossing it, and then rode a bus to go home. Thinking about it clearly now, I'm positive we saw a dogman. A werewolf-like creature that had been spotted here in Michigan on several occasions. I never believed it. Not until this happened. I had heard this story of an encounter with a creature called the Dogman. I just got back home on a Thursday afternoon, and I saw my dad with his friends on the front porch. I greeted them as I went inside our house. I was already inside when my dad suddenly asked me to bring them something to drink. I go to my room, put my bag on my desk, and then went to the kitchen to get something. I was deciding whether to bring a Coke or root beer when I heard them talking about Dogman. I brought them their drink and sat on the wooden railing and began listening. It was quite interesting. They did not even notice me as they were quite immersed in the story. Apparently, a couple was out on their way to Deadwood, Alberta, one Sunday afternoon. The couple passed by a road where on the side were full of trees and shrubbery and tall grass. As they were driving, a large animal had crossed the road just ahead of them. They didn't quite see all its features. It was far too fast and large, but they said it was pitch black. A couple of moments later, the same thing happened yet again. A fast animal crossing the road. They didn't mind it and just continued. It happened yet again. At the moment, they were beginning to feel puzzled, since this was the third time. The couple slowed down their car in case they might hit something that came out of nowhere. As they were driving slowly, the woman noticed a black dog staring at them from a distance. Its head was poking out of a thick bush and its body was now hidden. The man saw another one on the other side of the road, what they thought was a large dog. They speculated that it was a group of wild dogs or maybe wolves. As they got closer, they were able to make out more features. The face was a mixture of almost a German shepherd and a wolf. Very wild-like, but very intelligent-looking. The animal suddenly growled and snarled, exposing its teeth. And the noise was almost high-pitched. The couple then passed by these creatures, when suddenly, another one had crossed in the road, but stopped in the middle. It looked exactly like the other two. Its body was more hunched back than the others. Its shoulders arched. It stood up on two legs, making a wet noise as its bones cracked. It looked at them for a moment, before jumping down on all fours and dashing away. The couple that passed by it were nearly going at a crawl speed, terrified. Everything was going smoothly, and the woman screamed as this thing ran after them. I'm not really into these kinds of things, but I don't know if this is real or just simply an exaggeration of the real story. It was, after all, told by my dad's friends. And while they're not really known for storytelling or lying, you just never know with stories like these. This isn't my story, but a friend's. She wasn't going to post it. Not after the way the police mocked her out of the station, but after some serious bartering. She gave me permission to put it up under the condition that I changed the names and fudged the dates a bit. The entire situation is apparently still being investigated, and the last thing she'd supposed to be doing is talking about the incident, especially since she was the last one to see Clarissa alive. But that thing disappeared with her friend's body. The cops don't believe us. We had to let it escape without consequence. 
if writing this could save one person. It's worth the risk. And so, it all began when Clarissa asked May to go stargazing. The forecast predicted that the night would be perfect for viewing Jupiter. Clarissa had pulled out all the stops to get her way. She offered May the answers to her homework, offered to buy her food along the way, carrying her books. May's hesitance was born from the fact that the lake Clarissa chose, which is going to be redacted for legal purposes, was rumored to be hosted by some sort of strange creature. Eyewitnesses, however, were unreliable, as they had reported seeing a strange wolf standing upon his hind legs and walking like that of a man. Others insisted they'd seen a Bigfoot or a Vignetti. To put it simply, nobody knew what they saw, and so nobody really took legends all that seriously. No one important, anyway. Instead of believing us, or better yet, investigating the area, police oftentimes arrested kids out past curfew, fined their parents for the inconvenience. It didn't matter how many disappeared. They always asked the same questions. As made apparent when after the incident, the police asked all who had known about their outing, but nothing ever changed. The abductions didn't stop. The thing was never found and executed. Instead, we all carried on with our lives, continuing to ignore the truth lurking just beyond the cover of the trees. Anyway, they had got to the lake, both of them lugging sacks of equipment upon their backs as they searched for a good spot to settle down. The trail was long and lumpy, and May was desperate for a break. The night was alive with sounds of nature, crooning into the silence, and Clarissa immediately got to work drowning them out. She went on about stars and spent minutes detailing how to properly use the telescope while she set up. The endless explanations quickly grew boring. Then, they had apparently heard the sound of something large stalking their tent all night long. At one point... May had gotten up to use the restroom, but after a while, Clarissa noticed she had been gone for quite some time, going to check up on her, only to notice she was now nowhere in sight. She was gone, feeling very nervous considering all the folklore and legends surrounding this lake. She shined her light, and to her horror, she sees a blood trail leading from right around a tree back further into the forest. She screamed and panicked, running back down the trail in the middle of her night, in her pajamas, calling the police, not sure what else to do. And once the police arrived, a full-on investigation for a missing girl was conducted. They had followed the blood trail, but apparently it led nowhere. Her remains were never found, and while Clarissa was speculated as killing her, it was later discovered that, well... While the case is still ongoing, she had nothing to do with her death. At least, no foul play was speculated. I know this sounds like some sort of crazy horror story, but it's something my friend has to live with and is seeing therapy to learn how to cope with something like this. There's a reason she hasn't come public with it. Not only because of legalities, but, well, think of how easily she'd be written off. So my message to you and anybody that reads this, don't be so quick to blow somebody off for something that had happened to them. If they have a story or an experience, don't be so quick to be closed-minded. Listen, observe, use critical thinking, and always trust your gut instinct. Y'all aren't going to believe this, but I have to tell somebody or else I'm going to explode. So, there's this trail that cuts right through my neighborhood. It's very popular for dog walking, due to the dozens of light that's in the area. It's possible that these lights, that I saw what I saw. I was walking my dog Roxy along this trail when, all of a sudden, she starts becoming really whiny and fussy, growling and grumbling and barking and shaking. And she's pulling out all the stops, but for what? The trail was empty and it was a little late for dog walking, even with the stadium lights and an eight-pound security system. I was on high alert. But with nothing seemingly there, no matter how much I struggled to see what Roxy saw, it always seemed like something was around. It wasn't until I rounded a corner that I caught a glimpse 
of a large hairy figure with sharp teeth and long pointed ears that I turned around and ran with my dog. Now, before you blow me off, let me just say that this was not a homeless man, nor was this a person in a costume. The size alone is what scared me so badly. It was like a giant man, covered in woolly hair with a massive canine-like head. I don't know what it was, but I don't want to see it again, and I was not willing to take chances. I don't regret it, not even now. This event happened when I was 17, around a decade ago. Now I luckily live somewhere else. This is something that I've never talked about, or liked talking about, because it was during one of those ugly overall nights when we were wrong from the beginning. I grew up and went to a small school in a small town in Michigan. Our houses were close to the woods, which we'd frequently used to hang out. Nothing supernatural ever seemed to happen there. I mean, sure, we'd tell each other the occasional ghost story, or we would try and spook each other with horror movie references, but nothing more than that. Just teenagers being teenagers. I know this context may seem unnecessary, but it's important to understand why I chose to be alone this night. Some streets in my town were just of the verge of fields, uninhabited areas, undeveloped plots of land and woods. After all, the transition between teenage years and early adulthood is a very weird time. My group of friends was always the same four or five girls from childhood. But there were changes. Two were closer than the others, and suddenly started to become more secret. And soon, I learned they were talking behind our backs. During those years, I was suddenly left aside by my best friend. She had got a boyfriend, and without prior notice... She began randomly to give subtle hints that it would have been better for me to meet with my friends or something. She also distanced herself from other girls, and the couple soon got very possessive of one another. Her behavior had never been like that, but things in my home weren't the best, and nobody pained mind when I tried to bring attention to the subject. My mother would tell me to find a boyfriend, or not to be jealous. I wasn't jealous. My now ex-best friend was experimenting with mood swings and getting really mean. Something wasn't okay. I even lacked the specific words to describe it. My intuition told me something was very off. And so, I began spending time with the girls that were left in the group, which wasn't easy. Two had also gotten rather cranky, to say it nicely. You know... This was years before the whole feminist thing became widespread and subject of abusive relationships was only ever touched on if there was ever physical violence. Now, I really suspect my best friend in a toxic relationship was with this guy, and she was in denial. And for the girls, envy was just a part of it. One of them was newer in town, and her history was rather complicated, but she was still very charismatic. And so, one night, we were all hanging out at a friend's house, a mutual friend. She lived around ten or so blocks away. Some parts of the road were close to the woods, and just empty. Like I said, no development being built. I'd go there with my bike, spend as much time there as possible, and return during the day. All my friends were there, and my friend had invited some of the girls from another town. I remember... We were all hanging out, introducing ourselves, and on the subject of our careers, once we had finished school. One of my friends was going to apply for economics in college, while another really wanted to pursue journalism. We even discussed things like marine biology, anthropology, and other things relating to the science field, which always interested all of us in a group. One of the ways we would bond, actually, is by talking about nursing school, as a matter of fact. After a while, one of the girls got really snotty and mean with us, and things kind of erupted into a large argument. I decided to leave. There's no way I wanted to spend time around that kind of negative energy. They didn't like it at all. But after I left, several others left too. It was not the hangout I expected. Now, before I go any further, I want to state at this point, I was entirely alone and the appearance of what I saw was so sudden 
it could not have startled me any more. There, in the middle of the road, where I was walking my bike, was the strange creature, alone, on two legs. It was very tall and had yellow eyes, the same way that an animal's eyes glow at night. Its body was strange. I could not tell what its gender was. At first, I believed it to be a black bear, due to the protruding ears and the muzzle, but the more I looked at it, the more canine-like it looked. A wolfish one, to be exact. Even the way it moved, it was creepy and grotesque-looking. Its joints, every time it moved, would crack and twist weirdly. Something was very wrong with it. It was pure horror and completely unnatural, and it growled and moved towards me. It moved towards me very slowly, though, like it was a thief in the night and trying to be uncaught. Although I could clearly see this thing, and it knew that I saw it. I jumped on my bike, bumped up the gears, and I flew past this thing as fast as I could push my legs. I don't know if it ever chased me, because by the time I was two blocks away from home, there was nowhere around. I just quickly shut the front door, locked every door and window, and kept it all to myself, never telling anything about what I saw or experienced. That includes my friends, that includes my family, but I'll go ahead and go on the record and say that yes, what I've gone through on this day, I wholeheartedly stand by. I know I'm not crazy. I did not make this up. I gained nothing from sharing this. A couple of months after this happened, I moved over to New York for college. But to this day, it was still one of the worst nights of my life, and the scariest by far. We own a wheat farm and have a small farmhouse in the middle. Our main house is in a village near our farm, but sometimes we also spend the night in the farmhouse. I was 12. One such night, when I was in my room playing video games, I could hear something big moving in the field. I thought it was just an animal, since we do have big deer that come through here, so I ignored it. After some time, I heard my mum running upstairs to my room. She looked terrified and asked me to close the window. When I stood up to close it, I saw what I thought was a wild bear, and I kept looking at it. My mom scolded me, staying close to the window that the bear could not see us. But when I tried to look closer, its snout was longer and thinner in the middle. How could a bear look like that? I mean, I was sure it was a bear at this point, but the more I looked, the more sure I became it was not a bear. Long fingers, shoulders that were huge and muscular, and even the footnails were pointed and clawed. Its teeth were like large daggers sticking out of its mouth. Maybe it was hungry or something. It was growling heavily and was looking at the entrance of our house. Our farmhouse was far from village, so even if we called somebody for help, it would take time. I asked my mom to go hide in the basement, but she was already scared to leave me, thinking the creature outside is a wild bear. I could not tell her it is not a bear, but something may be more dangerous. I went down to hall and closed the window. I was walking close back to the door of the kitchen, and I heard this mild growl. Whatever this thing was, was now right behind the door. I was unable to breathe, and I put my hands in my mouth, so could not hear my breathing. I was shaking. I was so scared. I could hear it moving slowly, away from the door, and it let out this very low groan and this smell filled my nostrils. It was like death, a rotting meat left on the side of the road for days. I almost vomited. I ran to the basement to grab the shotgun. I went upstairs to my room where my mom was sitting in one corner. I went to her and tried to calm her down, asking her to listen. I told her it's not a bear, that I didn't know what it was, but I thought it was trying to get in the house. I really had no idea what it could be. She hugged me close. She was very frightened. We both looked through the window, and we could see it moving around the house, like if it was looking for a weak point, trying to get in, circling, eventually leaving off into the crops. After we thought it left, we contacted the village and many people came in the morning. 
That night felt very long, and we could not sleep. When villagers went looking for this thing, but could not find it, instead, finding a trail of dead, mutilated animals, from rabbits to deer, even a dog. After this, we moved back to our house in the village, and even decided to sell it afterwards, for fear that whatever this creature was might return. This was in the UK, by the way, back in the late 1970s. I didn't want to write this story. I was not interested in becoming one of the more internet lunatics who talk about their encounters, like with Dracula or even the ghost of Michael Jackson. However, I do want to know more about what I saw. As it turns out, I'm actually not alone. I googled it to see if anybody else had ever heard of something similar, and found that yeah, many people have apparently reported encounters about it, and it even has a name, Dogman. I know it sounds stupid, but there's not a better way to describe it, really. It's possible we might be onto something here. If it turns out that we've actually been witnesses to a real nature phenomenon, I'm glad to report my findings to the public. So here it goes. I recently began working as a security guard in a factory in Cincinnati. I will not be naming the place of employment to avoid any potential issues, but it is important to the story that I mention the factory is right next to a large forest. As soon as I got the job, I got stuck in the night shift. Of course, the newcomer gets the night shift. Anyway, I'd be willing to do it for a couple of weeks and then see if I could trade my spot for some morning shifts with somebody else. So there I was, receiving instructions from the boss about how everything works. Normal security stuff. However, he told me he had one last thing to warn me about. He said that lately, night shifters have been reporting sightings of some large big animal roaming outside the facility on the northern end. Nobody had got hurt, but in any case, stay alert. If things got ugly, just call animal control. I was already having second thoughts about this job. Great. Fast forward to the first night. I was in my post, just walking around, nervous. Every sound I heard, I would shine my flashlight on, but nothing ever showed up. Second night, same thing. Not a sign of anything roaming around. Guess the animal got tired of stalking a factory. I began to relax. Third night, all was normal. So I even got my headphones on and played some music. There I was, deep into the music, and I heard a faint rattling outside my headphones. At first, I thought it was a part of the song, but then the song ended and the rattling kept going. So I took off the headphones to hear it properly. There was no doubt the noise was coming from somewhere around the factory. I got my flashlight and my gun and went looking. And suddenly, the noise ended. I started to run, trying to find the intruder before they made a run for it. But I did not find anyone. I did find where the noise was coming from, though. On one side of the factory, a part on the fence that had been ripped apart. It was not cut, as it would have been if somebody had used those wire cutters. No, it was ripped apart, and the borders of the cable seemed to have something that disturbingly resembled large teeth marks. I cursed and ran away from the place, shining light everywhere in case it would still be around. I saw nothing else that night, but I did not turn my flashlight off, not for a second. The next day, I informed my boss of what had happened. He immediately sent people to get the fence fixed. I told him I refused to keep on going around at night, alone, if this thing was around tearing fences apart. We have no idea what kind of animal we could be dealing with here. Maybe a ravaging bear. Or worse, a bear, a mama bear with cubs. But he didn't care. He just said they would shut the place down for some days until they found the bear and moved it along. He could not afford to let that happen. He told me he would send somebody else to spend my shift with me. This way, I would feel safer. I didn't want to lose the job, so I had no choice but to agree. The fourth night comes around, and it's me and this other guy who had been working for a few years on this place. I'm nervous, wearing two jackets and two pants for extra protection 
in case of getting bit. Ridiculous, right? Well, I'm now holding my gun and flashlight with me at all times. I'm not sure what to expect anymore. The other guy keeps telling me I should chill out, and that I probably scared it off yesterday. He's not making me feel any safer or any more welcome. Eventually, the hours go by and nothing comes around. I make some conversation with the guy. He tells me it's not uncommon to hear animals roaming around, but due to how close we are to the forest, this is not the first time. They're just told to not talk about it, and they never get close. The whole fence is being ripped apart, though? That's a first. The night goes by, and now I've let my guard down. Me and the guy are just shooting, talking, talking about life to make the night go faster, and we hear this deep, angry growl sound coming straight behind the woods, not far from us. I shine my light in a second and see something that I'm still having a very hard time believing. It was this huge, tall, furry creature that was shaped like a person, but with the head of a wolf. I understand, that's hard to hear and hard to believe. Trust me, it was harder to see and accept. Its eyes shined red the same way a deer's would in headlights, except they were very visibly red, focusing right on me and bearing fangs. My partner merely cursed, took out his gun and shot it, but missed. The creature let out a howl and a spine-chilling noise, disappearing. So yeah, that was my encounter with Dogman. We called animal control right away. They came to check, but didn't find anything. Afterwards, the factory was closed for a few days, and I lost my job. I didn't mind that much. I'd honestly look for something else rather than stay there, risking myself for my boss that could not care for about our safety. They never found anything. I don't think anybody believed us much either. But we, or I, know what we saw. The other guy doesn't want to talk about it, and fear of being called a lunatic. Even if this was the so-called dogman, what else is out there? What happened was, my brother got admission into his favorite university. He moved out of the country. I decided to go there for his birthday as a surprise. I boarded the flight, landed on port, and called him. Lucky. He was so shocked and he took me to go sightseeing. We video called our parents and cut the cake in the park. It was quite dark, so the streetlights looked like spotlights with no ballerina around. There was this little shop behind our bench in the park, which was also a snack center. My brother got up to buy some drinks for us while still FaceTiming with my parents. I felt like someone was looking at us. Mom asked me about his friends being there too. She saw someone behind us, but he was all alone. I said it was just for the two of us in the park. Let me tell you about the park first. It had trees lined up on both sides of the pathway and seemed to function like roads. There were bushes crowded near the fence from start to end. It was beautiful, to be honest. We spent around three hours in the park. It was beginning to get late, so I asked him to drop me off at my hotel. It was my first time there. We rented these electric scooters and the street looked so deserted. The street lights on footpath looked empty. I was sitting behind my brother and I was enjoying the view when I saw this creature, like big and muscular ahead of us. It suddenly jumped from the woods. I asked my brother if he knows what this thing is, as it jumped out, but he was startled and scared to see this. It was unreal. He asked me what it could have been, and we stopped and entered the building nearby. We hid behind the gate. We could see it, though. It was seven feet tall, wide shoulders, and pointed ears. It was walking around like a man would be on its hind legs. It was alone, on a deserted footpath, and was kind of heading towards something we couldn't see. It jumped over the small ditch on the side and disappeared. I was dumbstruck to see this kind of thing, but my brother felt a little more at ease. We hid there for about 20 more minutes. While we were riding away, I did not ask him anything. That picture would not leave my mind. My brother informed me 
This thing is known as the Dogman. A concept I only knew as rumor. And now it exists. Somehow, I still don't believe it. I can't comprehend such a thing exists. I was 16 in 1989. At a time much different than now. You see, I am a believer in the paranormal. I even grew up with a poltergeist in our home, so I'm no stranger to dark and creepy things. But I never thought they could take physical form until this night. My friends and I thought it would be fun, with it being so close to Halloween, that we would sit around a graveyard and speak to ghosts in a graveyard. We used one of those old tape recorders. Remember, this was the 1980s, so, so the concept of an EVP session was pretty primitive, if not really well known at all. And I don't even think we called it that. We had a name for it, but I don't remember. But I digress. There were five of us in total. The same friend group they used to hang around all the time after school, getting into mischief and, you know, typical teenager stuff. I guess you can call it being bored with our extracurricular activities. But our friend, Ronnie, he was very, very much so into ghosts. And after having dealt with a poltergeist most of my childhood, me, not so much. But he was insistent that we go to the graveyard and do this. He's the one that actually had saved up enough allowance to buy the tape recorder and do this. It was all Ronnie's idea. We just went along with it. My other two friends thought the whole thing was a joke, and that spirits and ghosts did not exist, that you could not speak to them, no matter in a house, a haunted house, or even a graveyard. The closest cemetery was maybe a mile away, if I remember. A rather large one, and old, holding some graves back to the early 1800s. I had walked through it before, but never spent too much time really looking at tombstones. This is where Ronnie wanted to have our little EVP session, I guess, as they call it nowadays. It was not a seance. Maybe it was. I'm not really sure how to differentiate the two. So we set it up. I want to say it was maybe a week or two before Halloween night. I couldn't tell you exactly, but I do remember it was a school night. We all just told our parents we were going to be hanging out. We weren't curfewed, at least not that I remember. But we did have to be back at some reasonable time. After all, we had school the next day. But this was the 80s. The parents were more lax in some ways and strict in the others. We all met up at one of my friend's houses, not Ronnie's, but another. And we walked away there with our tape recorder, laughing and joking and thinking of all the things that could happen. Of course, we thought it was going to be a very uneventful night, that nothing would happen. Little did we know, even though our world was not shaken exactly, something still happened beyond my realm of normalcy and comprehension. We make our way to the graveyard, and it's now dark. It has been for quite some time. Since in October, the sun sets at about 6.37. It was around 9 p.m., 10. Something along those lines. I just remember it was dark now. We made our way to about what I would call the center of the graveyard, next to a very large family tombstone. It looked very old and weathered, probably dating back to the early 1900s, but I don't remember the dates. I guess you could say we kind of treated it like a seance, since I guess that's what we called it back then. We all sat in a circle. We didn't have any candles lit, but we sat in a circle, with the tape recorder on record right in the center of us. A brand new tape, in hopes that we could ask the spirit something, and when we would play the tape back, we'd get a response. Since this was Ronnie's idea, we let him be the ringleader. He could ask all the questions, and if he wanted to get answers, that was on him. I felt pretty neutral about the whole thing. I couldn't really think of any questions to ask, but I did find it interesting, if anything. Ronnie begins asking the age-old question. If there's any spirits here, please tell me now. Silence. If there's anybody here again, please, we are trying to make contact. Nothing. Except one of my friends began snickering. Ronnie got mad and gave him a very, very mean look. He even then introduced himself, claiming he would like to reach out to somebody whose life was now lost and their souls were wandering this boneyard. At some point, 
Ronnie had to shut up a couple of our friends. He had to re-explain to them that they were not going to get any responses, at least that were directly audible, and they would only hear something unless they played back on the tape. This went on for maybe 15 more minutes, but it's just a poor time estimate. It could even have gone as long as 30 minutes. But at one point or another, I remember one of her friends began almost acting panicked and pointing off in the distance. Off by the trees where he was pointing were a glowing pair of eyes staring in our direction. That's when the entire atmosphere around us changed. We were convinced we had somehow invoked a demon. The friends that were with us, who were not believers, became believers very quick. Even Ronnie had shut up, asking out loud, If that is you, taking physical form, please step forward. My friend grabs him by the shoulder. Are you kidding me? You're going to bring that thing over here? And this figure kind of lurched and stepped out more in the open. Not that we could visibly see what it was because of how dark it was, but enough we could tell it was very large and hunched over, and had a head that resembled a dog, with long hair draping all over its body. It was kind of drunkenly staggering, like a man who had taken one too many shots of some whiskey. We all got up and ran, screaming, ditching the tape recorder in the process. Maybe not ditching it, but forgetting to grab it. We didn't even bother to say goodbye, we just all ran back to our houses. The next morning at school, we were all too afraid to talk about it. Even Ronnie seemed pretty shaken up. But we figured, in class, we should discuss about going back and retrieving the tape recorder. Me and Ronnie were the only ones who had big enough kahunes to go and get it. We stepped foot, back in the graveyard in the late afternoon. It was shortly after school had gotten out and we walked away all the way over to where we were sitting the night previous. The tape recorder was gone. We also wondered if this thing had somehow grabbed it. This is a very old graveyard, not really visited by many people. Is it possible that security stopped by and confiscated it? Sure, I guess you can go with that theory. But it doesn't make any sense. And for the longest time, I've never really bothered to tell our story. I think my friends all just left it as is, in the past, not telling anybody. Ronnie soon lost interest in all things paranormal after this. I think he bit off more than he could chew with this experience. Myself, I've been too afraid to tell my story, thinking people would call us crazy. And in fact, as I grew older, got out of high school and moved on with my life, I kind of just forgot about it. It wasn't until the advent of the internet and all the... Real life encounter stories and what you youth refer to as creepypasta became increasingly popular had I been reminded of what happened that night back in the late 80s. Maybe I wouldn't be considered so crazy after all if I shared my experience to people who are willing to listen. But the truth is hard for me to speculate what it could have been. Sure, maybe some of the friends would have said it's a demon, but I don't know what it was. I can tell you this though. It did not appear until we started doing a seance, or EVP session. And part of me wants to believe it was supernatural, but I'm not sure. I've never heard of demons or ghosts that take physical manifestation, at least that I'm aware of, but please, I'm no expert on the supernatural or paranormal. It's just purely speculative. The only thing I can really say is that it really scared me. It scared all of us. And, like most high school friend groups, I lost contact with everybody when I went to college. So, I have no idea where all of them are at in their lives. And no, I have tried looking on Facebook before, but nothing. It would be interesting, however, to reach out to Ronnie, and see if he's still alive and get his perspective on it. Maybe I'll try and do that at some point. But for now, you have my telling of the story. Thanks for hearing me out. where we come from. People had always talked about the dogman encounters that people had had, but nobody in our town, where we grew up, believed it. It's like those tales they would tell us when we were younger, but as we grow older, we know it's not true. And me and my friends would always talk about it, wonder to ourselves if what our parents told us were true. One of my good friends invited me to go out on a date with this guy she had found online. 
It was weird. While we were going to go on a date together, he had introduced himself and said he was lonely, which I guess is probably not the best thing to introduce yourself and start off with, right? Well, after going out on a date with him, he seemed pretty innocent at first, but things began to take a very weird turn the more time we'd spent together. You see, after a few months of seeing each other, he explained to me that because of his night visitors, he often didn't get people coming over. That included his own parents, his family, and even, yes, girls. He was only 16 and emancipated, so he lived on his own, and this tiny little shop converted into a small one-bedroom apartment. When I would ask him, what do you mean by nightly visitors? He was pretty vague about it at first, explained that these large wolves would come to the backside of his house, kind of sniff around and look for trash, and it often scared his family away. I didn't believe him. I thought he had some strange habit or something weird about him that he was just trying to hide. He decided to prove it to me and invite me over to his house one night so he could show me exactly what he was talking about. I came over on a school night and decided to sleep on the floor in a sleeping bag next to him. I wouldn't exactly call us super close. We were loosely dating. I mean, I liked the guy, but there was still something off about him that I could not put my finger on. Well, come that night... Right around 1.30 or 2 in the morning, we heard noises outside, scratching and sniffling. And then he began complaining, saying that these things are here and they always keep him up at night, and he's having a hard time sleeping. He tells me I can go peek out the back window if I want to. I get up and curiously wonder my way over to the back door, thinking he's completely full of it. And to my shock, I see several large dogs, all black, larger than any dog I've ever seen. They kind of reminded me more of hyenas, honestly, than anything I've ever known. At least in the face and the way their backs were arched. They seemed to be communicating with each other somehow, making these strange clicking noises. Or that's what it sounded like. They began to almost move in formation and descended back into the tree line. I was so scared, I ran back to him, shaking him. You didn't tell me that there were mutant wolves coming up to your house. But he acted so careless and nonchalant about it. I tried to sleep the rest of that night, but I just could not. And the next day, we had a few classes together, since our high school rotated between A-days and B-days, like many other high schools do. And after that, he just got really weird, like he got overly clingy and would say strange stuff to me. And after a while, it really turned me off from him, so we broke it off, maybe about a month or two months later. I pretty much moved on with my life, compartmentalizing that memory as just some strange, weird off occurrence that happened in my life. But as I got a little bit older, the thought and memory came back to me, and I got curious, wanting answers. I guess it turns out that it's very possible what I saw that night could very well have been dogmen, or what they claim to have been dogmen. I'll let you decide for my story. This happened last year, in August. I was riding home with my bike. The road I took was usually windy and went through a small portion of forest. The town is very small and traditional. Everybody here talks of lots of myths and legends. When I go around during the day, and it's sunny out, I don't really like to go anywhere alone at night. It's probably because of all the bad things that have happened around our small town over the years. People disappearing mysteriously, or people being murdered. It's never been safe out there, and every person who lives here is aware of that. You'd be blown away by how many of these murders have been covered up, and not allowed to access the public. One night, though, I got caught up at a friend's house. You see, there was this girl I really liked, and I wanted to stay as long as I could to be there. When I got going, it was midnight and I had a very bad feeling in my gut, telling me to stay the night at a friend's. But I ignored it, thinking my parents were going to beat me. I just left and went home anyway. Along the way, I got tired and began to walk, carrying my bike next to me. Suddenly, in the distance, I heard something crashing. It was like something had stepped on a large branch or something, but it was very loud. I turned around and could not see very clearly, 
deciding to ignore it. All of a sudden, I hear another loud bang of foot against the ground, something growling deep. The fear I felt at that moment was something indescribable. I never felt that way. I thought I would pass out. I had heard loud footsteps approaching me very fast. I knew I needed to get onto my bike and ride as fast as I could to get to the nearest house in the village. I ran and ran, but it was getting closer and closer, and the growls were getting louder and louder. I could not ride anymore. I was too exhausted and needed to stop. The last thing I saw before I passed out were two bright eyes approaching me, and a creature that looked like a half-dog and half-human. When I woke up, I was in my bed. Nothing was clear to me, so I asked my mom what had happened. She told me they thought a dog had attacked, that I had claw marks. A few days later, looking up, this creature on the internet, I found out it's called a dogman. I knew that nobody would ever believe me, so this is the first time I've openly admitted to what I've witnessed. I'm not really sure how others are going to be receptive to what I have to say. Wish me luck. Five years ago, I was traveling with my family to my grandparents' house just outside of New Orleans. The traffic was terrible. We were late, stuck in the rain. While looking bored outside the car's window, I saw something strange outside of the road. Something strangely large. It reminded me of a dog or something. I noticed its size and the only thing I could see, which the window fogged up, and this thing caught my attention. After some time looking, the creature looked back at me. Its eyes, I noticed, were different from any normal animal, looking a little bit like human eyes. I did not believe in my own eyes and told my parents to see. When they finally did, the creature was not there anymore, and again, things went back to being boring. Hours had passed, and finally, we arrived at my grandparents' house. It was raining even more now. After dinner... I went to talk with my uncle. We'll call him Finn. We played some games and I began talking about what I saw earlier on the road. He got really serious looking and told me to never look into its eyes. I said, what? He said that this creature hunts everything that looks into its eyes. I told him to stop joking and he told me he was not. The creature was now following us, my parents' car. I thought he was trying to scare me, so I blew him off. Well, we all went to sleep, and I heard my grandfather's dog begin barking like a maniac, until there was one last high-pitched bark, and suddenly it got silent. I went to the window to look. I was trembling, scared, thinking about what my uncle said and trying not to make any noise without my steps. Outside was raining a lot. I saw in the yard what lasted the dog's house. And then I saw its body. The dog was headless. All its paws were broken and I screamed and I was terrified, running to wake everybody up. My parents did not believe in my words. They explained it was a nightmare. I needed to get back to my bed. I insisted and after trying hard to get them out of bed, they came to my room and looked out the window. My mother now paralyzed. My father ran to wake up his parents. My uncle was awoken and went out to see the dog's corpse. When he opened the door, the thing was there, the creature that killed the dog. And my uncle was paralyzed and he tried to backwalk, but the dogman began ripping apart the corpse of the dog. My entire family howled out of fear and terror, running back in the house, while my uncle grabbed his rifle taking the door open again and firing several shots in the direction of this large, hideous creature. The creature, now incredibly angry, almost rushed the house, running its hand right through the wall, then quickly retracting it, then disappearing as it got shot at several more times. We sat there, huddled, crying, and afraid at whatever this horror was that had just tried to attack our house. We were not sure what to make of it or what to even think, but we knew that terror had struck. My aunt, and being the most distraught of all of us, somehow decided to call the police. 
but they informed her there was nothing they could do, wished us all luck, and that we were now on our own. The rest of that night was like a ticking clock, always waiting for something to happen. The woods around were very quiet. Even my grandparents were very unnerved. We all slept in the living room, all with our guns next to each other. Not me, though. I was too young. But my parents and my aunt and uncle and my grandparents, waiting for whatever this thing is to come back. Once the sunlight came, my grandparents admitted that they believed this was the work of a Rougarou. A strange canid werewolf-like creature said to stalk the swamps around New Orleans. And now, it had finally found their house. Even the police knew about it, which is one of the reasons why they refused to come out and send anybody. They were not about to be a part of it or get entangled with this creature. And it was that day that I learned a lot more about the Rougarou than I would have wanted. Not only did I learn that it was more than folklore and very real, but I learned that it had been hunting my family for generations, apparently. My grandfather, I guess at some point or another, back when he was younger, in his later 20s, had made some sort of deal in blood. For what, he never told. But he said that ever since, this Rougarou has been following the family, attacking and stalking at random times, terrorizing aunts, uncles, children, grandchildren. It doesn't matter who or what. If there is a direct blood family connection to him, it will be a target. He has gone to churches, but mainly they either reject him or refuse to help him in a situation. I even now have a really hard time writing and talking about this, so excuse me for any poor storytelling or grammatical errors. We spent some extra time with my grandfather this time and tried to convince him to move out of state. After much debate and argument, we got him to move to western Texas, a much drier and safer place, and what's even more beautiful, no Rougarous around for miles, or so we think. I was six years old when this happened. I was playing outside with my friends. We would play all day, and when the night came, our moms called us inside. We all lived in the same neighborhood, so it wasn't far for anybody to get home. We basically could see each other getting in the house. My mom would always tell me scary stories about what would happen if I managed to stay out too late or did not behave. The scariest story is the one she told me about the dogman. According to my mother, it's a night creature, half dog and half man. It's twice the size of a human and it feeds on small children. I was never late to go home because of this. The fear of dogmen until one day, I was having too much time to notice it had gotten dark outside long ago, and I was now late. I noticed and quickly said goodbye to my friends, heading to my house, which was only a five-minute walk from where we were playing. On my way, I could not stop thinking about my mother's stories. I was still late home, and I was sure that something bad was going to happen. I got home safely. Nothing bad happened, thankfully. There were no dogmen trying to kill me, which made me start realizing maybe they don't even exist. My mom did give me a rant, though, but I told her it wouldn't happen again, and she accepted it. When I turned the lights off in my room, I got a very strange feeling. I was rather going to sleep with my lamp on that night. My house was made on only one floor, and the bedroom was right next to my parents' room. The windows in my room looked at the huge backyard of my neighbor's house. It had a ton of trees and plants. They obviously did all their own food. A greenhouse kind of people. I told my mom to check under her bed for monsters. We all go to sleep. And as always, I had a strong feeling that I should check my window. As I had heard something like a strong growl outside, I got curious. When I went to check the window, I saw something that makes me freeze to this day. Behind the trees and across the street was this giant black figure. I could not see it as clearly as I would have wanted to, but once it stepped forward, I realized this was the dogman my mother had warned me about. And suddenly, it jumped and began running toward the window, like a rushing football player. I didn't know what to do, so I just ran and hid under my blanket. I couldn't move for a half an hour. 
when I finally got the courage to go to my parents' room. I ran to, at the speed of light, literally. My mother told me when she checked my window, there was nothing there. She reassured me that she was mad about me being late that night, and the dogman concept is all made up. I should state here that she did not call it a dogman. I don't know what she called it, but it wasn't that. I only say that she called it the dogman is because later on, I learned that what I saw was probably a dogman. I couldn't sleep that night until I went to their room to sleep with them. It took me a very long time to forget about what happened that night and convince myself the dogman isn't real. Now that I'm older, and I have nightmares about the night still, and knowing Reddit, I understand that dogmen are actually real, which would explain what I saw. I was staying with the family for the wintertime. A nice, cozy home located in Michigan. It was kept clean, and there was never a time where there wasn't a fire on the fireplace. It actually belonged to my great-aunt, and she was very wealthy. She owned a large house with a large portion of property with woods in the back. It was on this back side of the property that something had happened, something I still have trouble believing to this day. I was just a few years younger than I am now, and my family was staying at my aunt's. The fire was warm. My mother was talking with her sisters, and me and my cousins grew bored of just sitting around, listening to older lady gossip. My cousin, Morris, told us he knew a cool place out back in the woods. After all, I had not spent much time exploring. We lied and told our mothers we were going to play football. We walked out the door with no football, but our moms did not question it, so we stepped outside and made our way to the woods, giggling like children. In our minds, we had just gotten away with the most elaborate prison escape. We walked our way to the woods. It was so cold we could see our breath every time we spoke. We got to the woods, but with a few hours left of sunshine, we found our logs, sat down, and my cousin Donnie pulled out the alcohol, and we began passing it around. We barely had to drink anything. It was our first time drinking. We all thought we were drunk. We sat around the bottle over time, buried in the snow. After an hour and thirty minutes or so of rubbing our hands together to try and get some warmth, we decided we should go in. We got up, we each took another swig, and Morris tossed the bottle on a tree. We all laughed and pseudo stumbled our way back to the house. We were drunk. Well, we weren't drunk, but we were fools who convinced ourselves we were intoxicated. Donnie was talking too loud. Morris was belching and I was laughing uncontrollably. This is probably the reason that we got lost and could not find our way back. It took us about 30 minutes to get back to the spot and somehow, it seems like we had gone back in a complete opposite direction from where we had come. We did not recognize where we were at all. It wasn't dark yet, but it was surely getting there. And Donnie began freaking out, saying our parents are going to kill us. Morris and I just laughed at him. Calm down, we'll find our way. We looked and looked for a way back to the house, but we couldn't find it. It was basically dark now. We sat down, didn't see any point in continuing on. We began to turn on each other very quickly. Yeah, great idea. Thanks for bringing us out here, Morris, Donnie told him smugly. He told him to piss off. I got involved and told them both to calm down. We decided it was time to get back to trying to find our way out, and we all stood up. I told everybody to look. We pointed at the path in the snow, and as Morris got closer, they were not footprints like we thought. When he said that to me, Donnie looked at me and asked what type of prints they were. He looked back at us, and with a somewhat worried look on his face, they were canine tracks. We weren't too worried. We doubted a dog can really affect all three of us. Maybe it was the alcohol. Maybe it was the fact that they were young and stupid. But we all blinked out on the fact that it may be one or more dogs. Maybe it's Nana's dog. After all, our grandmother had a huge husky. We all decided in unison that it was best we follow the path, hoping it would lead us to where we needed to go. After a while, the path stopped right in front of us, of a bush bigger than all of us. If we go through here, it may lead us to the front. 
the Donnie said, and we walked through it. On the other side was not one of our grandmother's home, but a snarling pack of wolves. None of us moved. They stared at us, horrible looking, and they all began to stand up in unison, like some sort of freak out of a horror movie. What sort of freak show had we just walked into? We all began trembling and shaking, and these three large mutant-looking wolves began to walk toward us, standing on two legs. They each took a few more steps, stopped, and the one bigger one turned to the other two, and kind of made this weird expression, and almost as if they were communicating with each other, kind of this strange clicking noise. They looked back at me and Morris, turned back at them, and then looked off in the direction where a howl was present, a very deep and guttural growl which sent shivers down my spine. And no, it was not from the piercing cold or the alcohol. These creatures looked off in the direction of the howl, then back at us one final time, and one went up to the other, dropped down to all fours and exited into the tree line, disappearing for good. We knew that was the moment. We needed to disappear and now. We began taking off through the trees, running as hard as we could, our skin crawling at what we saw, and knowing there's no way we could tell anybody, we nearly got devoured by werewolf-like creatures. It was by the sheer grace of God we made it back, but knew that our moms would never believe us. We decided to keep it quiet, and talked more about what we saw before we came in. We started debating about what it could have been. Were they maybe men in costumes role-playing? Could it have possibly been three men LARPing? I'm convinced that whatever we saw was no way, shape, or form a human, but some sort of unidentified bipedal canine. Near our home in Texas is a rather large patch of woods, so sightings of the occasional animal is pretty common. The area is mostly fenced. I'm pretty sure that just about everybody in our tiny neighborhood has military-grade firearms in their homes. The animals don't worry about us for the most part. Well, most of them, anyway. A few years ago, we had some trouble with a small family of bears, but that had been resolved. Now, last weekend, my friend Jacob and I were home alone, playing Call of Duty Warzone on my Xbox One. It was around 8 p.m. I was waiting on the pizza that we had ordered. We had gone through our food faster than I had lost my first game. Unlucky for us, the only good pizza place nearby took an eternity to deliver. I'm rather impatient when I'm hungry, so I had placed my bean bag near the window to sit on when it was not my turn. My room was on the second floor, nearly overlooking the woods directly. Between the house and the forest is a pretty wide road, and our backyard with tall wooden fencing. There are not any barricades between the road and the forest, just some rough land that acts as a transition. There are some streetlights, but that's about it. After dying for the millionth time, without much progress, suggesting we change the game to Rocket League, I went back to pouting by the window, looking outside in anticipation. My eyes fell on a peacock a little distance away. Peafowls and peacocks are common sights in our neighborhood. If you wake up early enough, you could almost always hear them cooing. I liked them, and since I had nothing better to do, I watched it as it waltzed around. A minute later, something else caught my eye. Creeping up behind the bird was this large black animal. I could not make out what it was, but it looked thin and weirdly shaped, like a bear. Its front limbs were disproportionately larger than its hind, and its movement was just bizarre. We had zero trouble with bears since quite a while, and since last time, it had not been a picnic. I was kind of scared. I called Jacob, who had just finished his first game of Rocket League, to watch the scene. He came over to the window. I watched as the bear pounced over the peacock from a distance. The bear grabbed at its neck from its front claws, stood upright, only on its hind legs as the peacock struggled to its grip. The posture wasn't like that of an animal. It felt far too human. This was not a bear. Bears don't hunt this way and, especially, do not stand upright on two feet as a human. Jacob saw it too, and said my thoughts out loud. 
His guess was that this was a wolf. As I opened my mouth to tell him that there are no wild wolves in Texas, I realized that the animal did look wolf-like, even from a distance. I could see its long snout and pointed ears. It resembled a wolf, but what kind of wolf was this? The creature had now sunk its teeth into the torso of the bird and was back on all fours, carrying it in its mouth. While the face had resembled that of a wolf, and the posture and body most certainly did not. For one, the animal towered over the peacock and was as large as a bear. The way it moved somewhat resembled the way of a silverback gorilla, until it broke off into a run in a few seconds. The animal had then crossed the road and entered the woods. What did we just see? Jacob and I said at the same time. I would have called Jinx if we hadn't just seen what we had, but we were both very weirded out. What it was, I am not sure. I wondered out loud instead, as Jacob still had his eyes glued to the woods. He asked if we had just seen a werewolf. I told him werewolves aren't this large, and I don't think they're true. I have no clue how big werewolves are anyway, even if they were real. But I said that anyway, since I'm sure as heck I don't want to believe that I had seen one outside my home. I called my mom, sure that she would not believe me. However, she did believe me, and sounded very concerned. She and my dad were spending the weekend at a family friend's house, just a few hours away. She told me that they would come right over and that I should lock the doors and not go outside. I called the pizza place next. It canceled my order. I did not want someone coming here and getting attacked by whatever that thing was. I also told Jacob to stay over. I did not want to be alone. Him leaving while that thing roamed around was not too safe either. And I knew where my dad's shotgun was, if worse came to worse. Next, I called up my next door neighbor, an old lady who... I know is Marie. I didn't think she would believe what I had seen either, but for her safety, it was worth a shot. To my surprise, not only did she believe me too, but was already aware of the creature. I had asked her how she knew, and in a very grim voice, she told me this bone-chilling story. Apparently, there had already been multiple reports of a wolf-like creature in our area since about two decades ago. A long while before my parents had ever moved in, the creature, described as a seven-foot-tall wolf, had been seen walking on two legs like a human and hunting animals in the woods. It had the body of a dog but could walk like a person, possessing strength that could uproot trees effortlessly. Thankfully, to my knowledge, it had never attacked a human and mostly just kept to itself. Cops and animal control had searched for it but with no luck. A while later... The sightings appeared to stop as suddenly as they had started, and the creature, as far as we know, had disappeared. Those who had seen it believed it to be dead, while the others never believed it existed in the first place, although I know otherwise. According to my research and the cryptid's Wikipedia, this creature is known as a dogman, and to my understanding as a supernatural entity whose existence is highly debatable. Well... I can unfortunately vouch for its existence. Only hope that the thing retreats to wherever it went two decades ago. I don't know what our options are if it does choose to come back and stay. First, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I'm 17, still in high school. I come from Michigan. You've probably never heard of where I'm at. It is very small. Very few people live there which naturally means that everybody knows one another. I have a very small group of friends, mostly from my class. We do everything together. All of us can't wait to finish high school and go to college, have a fresh life in a bigger city. That's why we spend most of our nights drinking and having fun in any way possible, hoping time flies by faster. Our favorite hanging spot was near the Ellenwood Marina, this place was nothing more than a regular dock for fishing boats, but is significant for most of us. Not only did we hang out near it for countless nights, but a lot of us had our special first there. First kisses, first dates, etc. There is something very special about sitting close to the water and having meaningful conversation. We usually don't go all the way to the docks, 
but rather stay a little further from the water. There's a small area with a tree stump on the ground. There, we set up some chairs around it and use it as a table. We've spent many amazing nights there, playing games and drinking, generally enjoying ourselves. The story I'm about to tell you happened during one of those same nights and began like any other. It was evening. Me and my friend Dave were the first ones sitting next to the tree stump with a couple of beers. We never have called each other to meet up. Somebody would always sit around that place, so if we had time to hang, we would just show up at the docks and look for others. The sun was already very low in the sky, and water from the white lake reflected its orange colors beautifully. It is a sight worth remembering and revisiting from time to time. During the next hour, the whole crew has arrived, and now there were six of us sitting around the tree stump, like King Arthur's knights, and drinking away. We were all a bit tipsy, when Jack suggested to a round of scary storytelling, since it was already very dark and quiet. Jack, after all, is the group's prankster. He loves teasing, scaring, and is always trying to find a way to mess with somebody. We all loved him. It didn't take too much convincing for us to start telling stories. The first one up was Peter, who hated scary movies, so he told one about the Loch Ness Monster, which made all of us feel bored and yawned. The next few stories got more and more interesting gradually, from monster sightings like Bigfoot to some other famous cryptids. By the time we all finished telling our own story, it was already very late, but we decided to stick around for another hour since none of us really wanted to go home yet. Jack needed to go piss, so he left us and went behind a first line of tree. There's a small forest space separating us from the city, but it's very boring and empty. We know. We've searched it completely for anything. Jack was taking a rather long time, and suddenly, he heard a noise coming from the forest. It was a growl, sounding much deeper than any normal dog. We were all startled for a second, and we realized it was probably just Jack messing with us, making the sound. Before anybody even told him to stop, we saw him sprinting towards the stump, and he looked scared. He began mumbling about the sound coming from the forest, but everybody else thought he was messing with us like usual, and then we all heard it again, this time closer and louder. It sounded like a dinosaur or a monster was nearby, so deep and guttural. You could feel the base of this thing, meaning it was incredibly large, like the size of a moose or an elk, something massive. Everybody who doubted Jack before were now all believers. All of our faces were as pale as snow. A terror reeked. Then, we all began to hear heavy breathing, followed by more growling near the end of the tree line. As it sounded like it came from some massive dog you would see on Game of Thrones, like a dire wolf or something. That's what I imagined in my head. We are all scared. We got up slowly and prepared to leave if we saw this thing sticking out between the trees. Which is conveniently when it decided to show itself. What I can say it looked like was rather frightening. It did exactly look like a large dog. A dire wolf. The size of its teeth alone was more than terrifying, and it wore this strange grin across its face, with stark, piercing, bluish-purplish eyes, and the fact that it was roughly seven or eight feet off the ground and built like a weightlifter. This was some werewolf monstrosity, if this thing was a killing machine, we were next on the list. The head looked so big, it was kind of ridiculous, like a bobblehead werewolf. It looked so disproportionate, and we were all beyond scared, and everybody was running as fast as we could towards the nearest street. The creature, whatever creature this was, began to give chase, but stopped after passing our tree stump. I was now running with my head turned towards him and saw it all. It stopped and stretched its arms at full length. As if getting ready to leap back, it did, and began burrowing in the ground, like a dog would digging, and dug and dug until it disappeared into a hole in the ground. We're all trying to catch our breath holding each other from falling over and pissing ourselves. As we see this go on, we hadn't made it very far. None of us were very athletic, and with the alcohol going through us, 
Well, safe to say, we were pretty slow. Running was not our strong suit in that moment. After it burrowed in the ground and disappeared, we took off running. More so than we could. More than we can endure. Being in Michigan, you hear stories about the dogmen and all the other folklore that goes along with it. But you never want to acknowledge it. It's something you don't want to believe. I mean, the having to acknowledge something like that is terrifying. But having to encounter it face to face is even worse. So since then, we haven't really hung out much at night. Really only during the daylight. I think it all scared us pretty bad that we don't ever want to see it again. If we can avoid it. The story of the Michigan Dogman might have an iota of truth in it, after all. There have been more sightings than Bigfoot. And in fact, the first sighting of the Michigan Dogman was in 1887 in Wexford County, Michigan. The creature was said to be seven foot tall, a blue-eyed or amber-eyed, a bipedal-like canine, an animal with the torso of a man and a terrifying howl reminiscent of a human scream. According to myths, the Dogman appears every decade especially during the fall time. Numerous sightings have been recorded in various locations all throughout Michigan and the Midwest especially, but primarily in the lower northwestern quadrant of Lower Peninsula. This beast was previously unknown to most people until the later 20th century. It was first sighted around the Manistee River, back in the days when the Ottawa tribes lived there primarily. The first alleged encounter of the Michigan Dogmen occurred back in 1887 in Wexford County. A couple of lumberjacks saw a creature they described as having a man's body and a wolf head. In 1937 in Paris, Michigan, a man by the name of Robert Fortney suffered an attack from five wild dogs. He also claimed that one of them walked on two legs like a human. Rumors of similar creatures also came from the nearby county in the 50s also in Manistee and Cross Village in 1967. While there was talk of the creature being of supernatural origins, others believe that there are scientific animal-based theories for this being's existence. Dogman sightings began in Michigan and spread with a few variations to the description, but the main characteristics have always remained the same. This was anticipated with any growing, migrating, and evolving species. Dogman sightings usually happen deep in the forest, around logging camps and out on deserted roads late at night. In 1987, the Dogman gained considerable notoriety and popularity when famous Traverse City Radio disc jockey, known as Steve Cook, wrote a song titled The Legend. Cook got his lyrics from reports of the Dogman encounters and people began reporting their sightings. In 1986, the fall near Manistee, Ray Greenway was driving home from the Manistee Army Recruiting Station. It was quite late at night, and he discovered something in the darkened fields beside him. His car headlights were reflecting off of something that appeared to be eyes. But the eyes of this creature were too high off the ground to be a deer. And suddenly, this unknown creature began running towards him, making an amazing leap, clearing the two-lane road with a single jump. He described it as having yellow eyes and a remarkable leaping ability. In 1887, other sightings were also reported during that time in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and denizens of dog tracks in the dirt around numerous dead horses. The horses were rumored to have died of fright. Fast forward to 2001. In the fall, a witness allegedly claimed to have spotted a werewolf-like creature stalking the hill behind their house. She described it as black in color, like a big bear with haunches and the head of a wolf. While that was the first and last time residents of Cass County, Michigan ever saw the dogman, the claim to hear it splashing around the 20 plus acre swamp late at night. Sometimes they hear it shriek once in a while. The shriek is as loud and piercing like an infant's, hysterical and loud. 2006, one of the most famous dogman encounter was on an on-star incident that occurred this year. The incident had happened in Troy, Michigan. A man was driving when he suddenly spotted something that he described as a great big dog standing upright in front of him. On reflex, he immediately veered to avoid hitting the creature 
ended up running off the road, causing the vehicle to flip on its side. Luckily, he and his passenger remained unhurt, and with the help of OnStar, he got assistance. OnStar has a recording of the encounter. In 1938, a 17-year-old boy named Robert Fortnoy, allegedly while standing near the river in Paris, Michigan, was confronted by a massive black dog. Fortney did not report his encounter until after 49 years, but he vowed the beast had stood on its hind legs and glaring at him with piercing blue eyes. Scared out of his wits, he shot at the creature and it quickly fled. Fortney was still terrified by the ordeal for many years to come. In his statement, he said, I quote, Maybe it was a result of fear, but I swear the dog was grinning at me. And again, in 1993, Another dogman encounter was reported by a 13-year-old girl named Courtney, with her family living in Reed City, Michigan. Courtney had decided to sneak out for a quick puff of cigarette behind her family house. This is where she would encounter the worst scare of her life. She claimed to have seen a glint of light flickering out from the planks of an old abandoned barn. That had gotten her attention. She traced its movements, and slowly she realized there was something there. She saw that it was a six-foot-tall thing with a man's body and a dog's head staring at her. She took to her heels and was utterly terrified. Later, her neighbors affirmed that they have also spotted a creature in the abandoned barn. They described it as a buffalo-sized dog lurking in the barn. Other encounters described it as having features of a wolf, while others said it looked more like a dog standing on its hind legs. Whatever the depiction, it shows that there have been numerous sightings of dogmen. Could the legend of dogmen be nothing more than just mass hysteria? These handful of reports seem to prove otherwise. I hope you find this interesting, and as you release so many more videos of this topic on your channel, I hope you as a researcher look deeper into these and understand, wherever side you're on, open-minded or closed-minded, that there is truth to the dogmen. And that saying Michigan dogmen seems so one-dimensional, since they're being spotted all over the United States and the world. This story is about how me and my friends encountered an angry, vicious creature while hunting in Alaska. It was a typical sunny Tuesday when me and my friends went hunting in the Arctic. We wanted to hunt the main animals like muskox and caribou or moose. Maybe if we can get lucky, even hit the jackpot of hunting a black bear. Basically, we wanted to have a boy's day and have fun from our busy lifestyles and constant work pressures. The place we came to hunt here had plenty of animals to be hunted. We began by offloading our rifles and hanging them on our backs since we wanted this to be a fun challenge. We decided to hunt without guns and only use bows, spears, or injections. We were a total of six guys we decided to split into groups of three. Whichever group had the most animals hunted without the use of a rifle would win. We couldn't even travel in our vehicles. That meant full Stone Age style hunting. The first few hours went smoothly. Me and my two friends hunted two big moose and one muskox, using only spears. It was very hard to hunt them without the use of a rifle. I don't really know how people in the old ages hunted without the use of them. We obviously couldn't lug around the mooses and muskoxes we hunted, so we set them up near a tree, hoping some animals wouldn't eat them till we came back. We did take a picture of them as proof, in case some animal did eat them. Yes, we took this game very seriously. When it was 7.30pm, we decided to go back to our meeting spot as this is the time we had decided to meet again with all the animals we hunted. We began tracking our way back from the X marks we had left on the tree, so we knew where we came from. The GPS doesn't work here, due to lack of signals. That's why we had to leave marks. As we were walking back and chattering, we heard rustling behind us. At first, we ignored it, thinking maybe it was a goat. But the rustling continued to follow us, so we decided to kill whatever this animal was, so it would stop following when we looked back and around the trees to see what animal it could have been, 
we were utterly shocked and perplexed to see this strange type of creature. It wasn't a normal animal, nor was it a human. It was something in between. It had the head of a wolf, but the body of a human. Except it was covered in unnaturally thick body hair all over, and more like fur. Not even kidding. Literally all over, just like a wolf's hide, but with a human's body. It had long, muscular arms and legs with long, pointy claws. It could scratch deep enough to cut and slice human flesh. It began growling at us, and we spotted it, and slowly began walking towards us with this evil snarl. We were shocked. It quickly took our rifles from our backs and pointed them at this creature. As soon as it saw our rifles, it became even more angry and fully began growling, moving towards us. This scared us out of our wits, and we began running all the while shooting behind us, with no good aim or direction. One of my friends, Alex, tripped on a fallen branch. To save him from being ripped apart by this creature who was gaining upon us, me and Josh, my other friend, stopped and turned back and started aim with the intention to shoot at it, just till Alex got up and we could run together. Surprisingly, the bullets did not affect the creature at all. Instead, the more we shot at it, the faster it ran towards us. The constant shooting and screaming must have alerted our other friends and some other hunters present, all of them becoming towards the noise of our shooting. As we began hearing voices of our friends asking why we were constantly shooting, we screamed at them to load their guns, that there was this wolf man, whatever it was chasing us. The creature must have also heard the other hunters coming to see the commotion. It quickly fled. When our friends had arrived, the creature had already fled. We narrated the whole story to our friends and other hunters that had arrived as well. At first, many were skeptical, but they saw Alex's bruises and abnormal footprints on the ground and blood. We then thought of calling it a day, going back to our vehicle. We kept our spears and other hunting equipment in the back, but kept our loaded rifles with us in case we encountered another one of those things. No telling how many there are out here. Later that night, I searched the description of the creature online and learned it was a dogman or maybe a wendigo. According to Google and Reddit, many people have encountered the same thing. Maybe I was not the first person to capture it. This is how our relaxing trip turned into an encounter with death itself. I don't even know if I'll ever go hunting after this. Maybe this is a sign that we should stay away from natural habitats, at least until we deem it safe. My friends and I loved playing basketball after college for hours until we were absolutely beat and exhausted. It's only then do we go back home, and to keep it going, we have a fun challenge between us friends. Whoever turns in first for the day from playing has to fetch the basketball for everybody as they practice shooting. Anyway, it's pretty common for us to be playing until 8 or 9 at night, and one evening, we're playing basketball on the court. It's in the center of a park, so other than two lights on the opposite ends of a court, there was no one that night. We were just playing like usual when Mark's friend, his phone rang. He went to take it and told us that his mom was going to beat him if he did not come back home that instant. So he shrugged and tried to run. The guys caught him and we made fun of how he had to stay for a couple of minutes, fetch the ball as the rest of us practiced shots. So he stood under the basket, waiting for us to shoot it in. I should mention here that we're all pretty great at it, so he knew he wouldn't miss. We wanted to mess with him. We began purposefully missing and hitting the board with a lot of force, so the ball would bounce off in the distance. It never went more than a couple of steps, until my turn. I jumped, threw the basketball with as much force as I could, and the ball bounced off, quite a distance into some bushes outside the court in the dark. Mar cursed at me, but obviously that didn't make a difference. We were chatting and waiting for him when we heard his scream. All of us turned our heads to see what was wrong. We ran in his direction and saw him on the ground, visibly shaking. He wasn't saying much, 
he only kept looking and pointing in the bushes. Taylor shook Mark, which got him out of his trance, and he told us he saw something behind the bush. We brushed it off, just going to tease him about it. Something rustled behind and we saw it. Then it emerged. It was something we had never seen before. The thing had a face of a dog or a wolf, but the body was human, I swear, and it growled and snarled. Taylor, Gavin, and Mark all pulled him out without looking back even once. We all went back to Mark's house and directly into his room. None of us said anything for a good ten minutes. I'm sure we were all wondering what we had just seen. Norman, our buddy who was with us, broke the silence and asked if that was a werewolf. A few of us chuckled, but you could tell we were all uncomfortable and still unsure about what had happened. A creepy dog-like creature outside the basketball court. Let's not meet again. My dad and I go hunting every weekend. Just the two of us. Living in Montana has its perks and benefits, especially when it comes to a great hunting spot. We always come back with something and enjoy a delicious dinner after. Last weekend, we went into the forest again. Our little getaway. My dad doesn't let me use guns because I'm only 15 right now. But he talks me through all the steps and what to do, what not to do, how to spot prey, how to get it, the right spots, etc. These few times, I've been his guide. So, I was talking a few steps ahead of him. Careful of my steps so I didn't step on twigs or crispy leaves and alert the deer of our presence. All the while being aware of my surroundings. It was a relatively warm day. I spotted a deer in the distance. It seemed like it was maybe just three years old. There were no other deer around it. The deer were quietly smelling something on the ground and leisurely walking around. I signaled to my father that I had found an animal. He quickly followed up and began taking aim. I waited for my dad to decide when the right moment for pulling the trigger was, as I watched the deer's movements closely, trying to assess when I should shoot it, if I had a gun and how good of a shot it would be. Anyway, for a while, there's no sounds around us. Nothing at all. And suddenly, we noticed the deer's ears went on high alert. I thought maybe we had made some sound that it was able to pick up on and that our hunt was gone. But then it immediately looked around in a different direction than us, which made me think there was something else or someone else, maybe another hunter. My dad didn't take off his aim, but steadied it. The deer did not move away yet. In a flash, something jumped from behind the trees and onto the deer, smashing it against the hard ground. My father covered my mouth. I didn't make any sound that would get whoever attacked the deer's attention. He pulled me back and we began to back away slowly and carefully. The thing had a head that was similar to that of a wolf. But the body was human-like, covered in black fur. The thing turned its head, staring directly at us, into my eyes. Its mouth with blood all over it. The thing was disgusting looking. I felt nauseous. Even thinking back to it, I feel sick to my stomach. My dad just told me to run, and we got out of there. We came back briefly the following day to try and find more evidence of what it could have been, but we found nothing conclusive. This is the first time I'm publicly sharing this story. It happened back in 2017, and I still cannot believe what I'm about to tell you. Here we go. It was summertime. I had just finished finals for the year and was very excited to go home for a while. I had finished my third year in engineering and was honestly drained out, in desperate need of a break. My school break was going great. I had been spending time with family and relatives, visiting friends, and just living my best life as a 21-year-old. My friends and I had this tradition since we were 12 taking our bikes out into the woods and hanging out there for a day. At first, we'd do that during the daytime, going back home once it was dark out. Once we were older, our parents allowed us to stay there for longer. 
we'd go out and camp for the night and go home for the day after. We loved doing this and would go once or twice during the summer break. Well, this time around, we decided to take a car and go farther than we've ever gone before. We thought we'd go on a trip to the mountain, relatively close to our town. There was a nice forested area right under the mountain. It was known to have a nice camping spot. We'd go on a Saturday and come back home on a Monday. It seemed like the perfect plan. We had not gone to the woods since last year, so we were all very excited. We packed our stuff into our trucks. There were four of us, so we took two. We took our two tents, gear, food and water. I also brought a gun. You never know what you might run into. It is better to be safe than sorry. As my dad kept telling me while he was giving me the gun. At first, I refused to take it, telling him I won't need it. But he insisted, so I gave in. I thought, okay, I'll take the gun. Put it in my bag and I'll just give it back to him once we return. It was fully loaded, wrapped in a towel and put it at the bottom of my bag. We started the trip on a Saturday. It was probably noon or a little after. The drive took us a couple of hours. We stopped here and there along the way, but we finally arrived to a parking lot near the forest. It had a few parking spots and all of them were empty. Apparently, there were no campers, so they were probably moving the first ones to get the ideal spot in the woods. We took our things and began moving through the woods. It was a beautiful day. We had never been to this forest, but we took a map and prepared for the unfamiliar terrain. We explored, took some pictures, and just overall enjoyed our day. Once the sunset was nearing, we decided that it would be a great time to set up the camp. Plus, we had stumbled upon a small clearing, which seemed like the best place to do a campsite. We settled there, built a fire, and made some dinner. I don't know if any other campers have come into the woods after us, but we had not heard anybody. I assumed there were no other people near us that night. At around 10 p.m., we called it a day. We had brought two tents, like I said, so in each there was room for us. I think I crashed out pretty quick, but I was awakened by a loud noise sometime during the middle of the night. It was probably closer to three. The loud scream-like noise came from the north. My friend had heard it too. We opened up our tent to check out on our friends in the other tent. They were inside and peeking out just like we were. We could not see anything. The noise sounded like it might have been from a mountain lion. It was pretty far away, so we decided to wait it out. And it disappeared. It did not bother us. We went back to bed, sleeping soundly until the morning. Everything was okay, so we felt relieved that nothing had come up and messed with our stuff. That Sunday was spent further exploring, lounging on our campsite and playing poker. The day just slipped by so fast, and before we knew it, it was already twilight. We started dinner, opened some beers, and gathered around the fire. It was perfect, and the moon was full. You could easily see around the clearing we were in. Since the day had gone so well, we all assumed that the mountain lion from the night before would not bother us. We had planned on going back home tomorrow anyway. We crashed for the night, at around midnight this time. All was well, up until about two in the morning. I woke up to that noise again. However, this time, it seemed to be closer than before. It sounded like a wolf howling combined with that high-pitched scream. It was very strange. I know there are no wolves here in Texas, at least not in this area. I know that for sure. What could it be? I poked my head out of the tent and got a look in the direction of the noise. It looked humanoid. Not human at all, but it stood up straight. I want to say it was human because it was very furry and had a very wolf-like head and appearance, and it was coming toward us, where our campsite was. I don't know if it was coming for us or our food we had left out, since it was a wild animal. It made no difference. I took out the gun, ran outside, flipping off the safety, all four of us went into the trees as fast as we could muster. Once it reached around our tents, it destroyed our camp. It remained there for a while, so I shot at the thing once. 
I don't know if I heard it or what, but it quickly fled and disappeared. We remained there in the trees for about an hour, too scared to come down or out. It was clear that it would not be coming back, or so we assumed. It gathered what was left and we got out of there, even though it was dark. As we're going back, I cannot be more thankful that I had a weapon with me and we got out of there when we did. I don't even want to imagine what would have happened had that thing got to us unguarded and without a firearm. I regret all of us not bringing a proper rifle to defend ourselves. Thankfully, I had mine.